at uh, 6.05 this evening. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Uh, appreciate your attendance. Uh, and so um, any agenda revisions at this point? Can we prioritize, maybe? Yeah. Um, we could prioritize. Given the important discussion that we need to have around the budget, mm -hmm. and I just don't see us being able to get to all this. But I know there are some things that have to be talked about it. Um, town meeting prep, Amy's been begging us to kind of address the building use policy. Uh, so I see those being priorities. Uh, we also, we, we have to deal with the um, Judge teach out waiver because that is due, so three, three, due three, tomorrow. Okay. So three one three two three three and three six. Three one three two, three 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 six. So far, that's okay. So we'll do it. We'll go through those and then see what what our time looks like. Yeah. Hey, Caroline, any? That good? Okay. So uh, I'm going to welcome guests. Any public comments? I have. Uh, I'm L.A. Bird from the Dance Hand Committee. I'm wondering if I could give a, like a two minute update on the. Acoustical engineer visit. Um, we had a discussion in the November meeting about renovations to the gym. Is this appropriate? This is this a good time to do it? Yeah. yeah. Um, the, uh, the acoustical engineer that we hired is Andy Carballero from a firm called Ascentech in Cambridge, Mass. And he came up here and uh, spent a couple of hours on December 28th um, initially meeting with a group of people who had an interest in the issue and sort of represented the constituencies. Nate Picard and Pete Contest from the school were here, Barry Bolio from the school theater program, uh, Van Shapiro, the sound guy um, from Mad Tech Sound, uh, and Don Hirsch, the uh, theater designer, and there were some people from the bandstand committee. And we spent time talking about what the, what the issues were, uh, the, the goal, as far as Andy goes, was to get an analysis of sort of a sound profile of the gym and what kinds of uh, renovations or changes would need to be done in order to deal with acoustical issues. And we, we talked specifically about something that was raised at the, the November meeting of the school board, and that was a concern about kids who are impacted by sort of unlimited sound in the gym. So we, we flagged that for him. Um, and we are expecting his report either late next week or the following week. When we get it, obviously, we'll share it with the board and you know, step by step. I want to let you know what was happening in that. Great. Thank you very much. Yeah. I have a quick question. Was his assessment subjective, or did he produce sound in areas of the gym and then measure He's, it in other areas? He had all this equipment. Okay, yeah, so he... A, it's, okay. A, it's, a, it's a, an engineer's analysis. Okay. Great. Um, so, Thanks. Yeah, it wasn't just walking around and sort of oh, getting the okay. sense of the place. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, thanks very much. Um, we're on to 2.1, approval of the minutes for um, December 12, 2013, 2018. Uh, is there a motion? Oh, I'm sorry. December 13, 2018 minutes. Is there a motion? I wasn't there. I don't feel like I should... Hmm? I said I wasn't there, so I don't think I can. Um, oh, I'm moved to approve. Second. Yeah, second. Okay. Sorry, I thought you were doing. Yeah. No, any objection? Uh, any co any comments on the uh, the minutes or the accuracy of the minutes? The the only thing that I um, wanted to add, just to, to clarify, in regards to our um, how we prioritized, how we were giving guidance and prioritization. Um, I wanted to be clear that when I was wanted to go under the 30000 that was being recommended reducing our funding to the capital fund, it was much less than 30000 But I didn't want that was not made that clear. So I just want to make sure the minutes reflect that. What section was that? I'm sorry. That is page 2, the very end of 322 on page 2. It's the third to last. So you want to say reduce capital funding by much less? Yes. Than yeah. yeah, so I remember Chris had said specifically 30. I specifically said 30. Mm -hmm. I think um, Brian was really clear that he wanted less than 30. I don't remember that Woden gave an amount. So if that helps. 
see any other changes? Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Um, next, is there a motion for uh, approval of the uh, minutes from December 19, 2018? I move to approve the minutes. Second. Any um, comments? Okay, move to approve. So moved. All in, all in favor? Aye. 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 <laughs> um, so now we're up to 3.1. We're going to have the uh, budget discussion. And I think. Uh, and I, can I go back to 1.3 public comments and correspondence? <laughs> sure. Um, in May, we had agreed about a response that we would give. And I'm not sure if the board isn't being copied or if the responses aren't going out, but dating way back to November, um, there were a little bit of inconsistencies with the replies people would get because um, Chris had replied to one, you know, saying thank you for your correspondence. Um, other people didn't get any response. And so if we could go back to what we agreed in May about having the clerk just say, I think it was something like, thank you for re your response. We will be discussing this at the next meeting and somebody will get back to you because I feel like um, our agendas have been quite full. We haven't been getting to all the items. And because of that, we have this backlog of emails where we have not discussed it as a board and come up with a response to people. And I don't know that they're waiting for it, but it feels a little um, like we're missing on that goal of having better communication with our community. I don't know what you're talking about as far as emails. I can do, I'll look up the original response and reforward it to everybody. Uh, but I'm not sure what sounds great, but I don't what I don't know which ones you're talking about. Which emails did were they emails sent to the school board as a yeah. uh, so an like Sorsha Anderson was one who sent an email back in November. I didn't see any reply to her. Okay, wasn't she talk? Wasn't her email actually to Bill though? And didn't he and copied us and uh -huh. then and didn't he respond? And generally, I do not respond right, back. Right, but she, the board I thought she sent two. So I thought she sent discussion. one to Bill and CC'd us. Okay. I thought she sent one directly to us. I can look back, um, but if, there have been if, several. Yeah, we received several just and over the course of between the lawsuit and um, okay. the matters as well. Okay. So um, when we do this, be a future agenda item to um, address all the backlog emails that we have and put them on perfect. for discussion. Yep. So our next board meeting. I think that's perfect. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> and if the, if anyone has it, the, um, the categorization of the backlog, uh, sharing it with everybody else would be great, just because then we'll be on the same page. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so now we're going to be on uh, budget draft number three, uh, agenda item 3.1. Yep. And I think there's kind of some... So a couple of things. Yeah, well, let me give you a general discussion. overview of, of some things, and then I think I need to do a little bit of almost workshop here to get folks up to speed on the budget and how it, how it reads. So uh, based on some questions that Allison had forwarded me. So um, the budget that you have in front of you, I sent you a memo on, in the front of this, which is on page seven. At the last meeting, you remember we were $107,000 above the threshold yep. for uh, spending, a lot of spending. Um, as of this moment, we're $38,000 above the threshold based on the direction that you gave us, which was to look at everything but personnel. So we did that. Um, we looked at, uh, you had made a decision as a board to reduce the transfer to the capital fund by 30,000. So there's a $60,000 transfer in this a budget that you have. I don't think we made a decision as a, a board. I think board members, board members that gave that advice, but it wasn't a agreed upon board directive. Right, we individually it. listed it as our pri order of priority. It was an option. You, you were exploring options, but whatever. Okay. <laughs> um, you took that into account in your analysis. Yes, it's okay. in this. It's in the amount that you're seeing right here. Great. You will also see that. Um, we had, since that time, we had finished open enrollment for health care. And with one of our, we had had our, uh, one of our teaching positions was not quite full time. 
and that person worked as a paraeducator. Um, and we had filled that, we had historically filled it that way. That person, it's not something that we, that we have a need, we have a need for it, but not a high level need for it. If you get, you know, trying to look for places to cut. So that's one that's in the, uh, it, that plus the healthcare reduction is about $58,000 and change. Um, where did I just, just put my spread? What's cover. the healthcare reduction? Can you describe that more? So what happens is we have people when they decide to every January one is open enrollment. Oh, people okay, this can is re, just okay. Now can I know. change their enrollment status from okay. either single, two person, family, uh, parent, child, or family. Okay. And people change their statuses. That's what you meant. Got it. Yep. All right. So that was a total of fifty-two thousand um, dollars. We also had more money that we always are modeling because December first is the time for teachers to let us know if they have enough credits to move on the salary scale over another column, and we call those horizontal moves, and that reduced it by $6,500. So total, we had almost $90,000 worth of reductions. Including the $60,000 transfer? The, the $30,000 transfer. It was 30, okay. Yep, yep. So it's, uh, with that, that got us to where we're $38,000 over the threshold. Um, as of today, we've been looking at some energy modeling, um, just this year alone, we usually do a three-year average for energy, but this year alone, just this morning, Laura and I were looking at some energy modeling. It looks like we might save overall about $7,000 in energy compared to this year's budget. Um, so if you wanted to take another seven out, you could. We could get it down to about 30 over without looking at personnel. The what I wanted to do was go through, there's some questions about the budget. So I wanted to look at these columns. I'm gonna go right to page nine and 10 and I wish, do we have the, do we have an overhead in here? Maybe that would be good for everyone to see that. Do we have an over, is there a document camera over there? No, no there isn't, unfortunately. Um, I don't think there is one, is it? Okay. Um, the, if you look at this budget, and the way it sits, this left-hand column is the actual from fiscal year 2018. That's last year's budget. That's what we actually spent. The next column is the budget for this school year, 2019. And then we have projected adjustments that are in the third column. And the fourth column all the way to the right is the budget for this year. That's being proposed for, not this year, sorry, for FY20, which is the proposed budget that you're looking at. Okay. So those, this is what, it's printed just like this in the town report. Yep. It, those, those four columns. So you, you get one year of actuals. You have last, this current year's budget, what we're projecting, because we always adjust it to try to look at lines, what's happening, and then what we're budgeting for this year. Got it. Okay. And so we're going in January, we're doing a fiscal year, January to January. Nope. No. Our fiscal right. years one run same as school years, July, July 1st to June 30th. We are, and so the fiscal, the way you do fiscal years is the second year of the school year is the fiscal year. So when I say FY20, which is next year, it's 1920 19, school year. This okay. year's fiscal year is fiscal year 2019, school year 1819. Okay. So that, um, I think that came into why there were a bunch of questions that you had, Allison, because it actually there's differences, then they'll change some of the questions. Yeah, I thought this was fiscal year. I couldn't figure it out based on the one year. I'm like, why does it not say two years? And so then yeah. I thought it was fiscal year, and I tried to look it up online, and it was, I don't think everybody does their budget the same. All schools run these, have to run these budgets in the state of Vermont the exact same way. All right. By handbook two. Okay. So we're all required to do that. Um, so some of, one of the first questions that you had, I'm just going to go right down through the questions. Can we get some perspective on IEP versus Tier 2 students and associated costs? So um, I'm going to have um, Amy talk about the services people are providing. Um, I can tell you right now the total SPED costs in this budget for next year are 454000 I'm just going to stay to the thousand instead of rent, you know. And what that is is, if you want to look at the budget to know where you would go to that, you would go to page 11, and you would see two parts. 
the instructional services special ed, which is 257,000 as mm -hmm. a total, and then the 196, almost 197,000, that's a net cost coming from the SU, because if you remember, the statute requires that all services except for paraeducators for special education run through the supervisory union budget. So we charge a net cost to the building. So what we're actually paying is 196,000. That 257,000 is there for illustrative purposes? No, that is there for your paraeducators that work in this building that are providing special ed services. But that's the part of it that's paid directly out of the Romney budget and the one- They're both, the 196 okay. is paid directly out of the Romney budget in this current year configuration. Okay. For next year, it will be a different, as we take this and put it together with the other budgets as we're mm -hmm. ordered to do, that will be a different methodology. Remember, we were asked by, I'll, let me get some context for folks in the office. We were asked by the executive committee to fill budgets this year by individual <laughs> schools, and then if there was a force merger, to push it, to pull them all together. And so we're in the midst of doing that right now. Um, and before we hear from Amy, I just wanted to get clarification about the question um, and kind of what the purpose of it is. Because I'm, I don't know if it's because I have more of an understanding of what each one means. Um, I'm not sure what we're going to get out of getting more specific about the costs associated with each because I feel like it's one thing to categorize EST versus IEP for educational purposes and plans um, and for the school in terms of what's done, but as a board and for the cost, and it's, it's all about need. And unless we have some concerns that the school doesn't have you know, appropriate systems for designing that, I'm not sure how the answer to the question is going to guide our work. So I'll tell you how for me it was because <laughs> I was thinking outside the box and I was thinking, what, what are, what's the other low hanging fruit here? Um, it's all going to be health care and teacher salaries. And the, the most of the rest of these things are fixed costs that I just, there's not really anything we can do about them. So I'm wondering, okay, so what if we offered a subsidy to people who moved here and rented with kids for a year? If you have, you know, you have one or more children, you move to Rumney, we're going to pay you $2,000 a year. How would that work out? And they're like, oh, okay, but what if we get kids that have special needs? Is that going to actually make it worse? And so uh, budget-wise, yeah. just budget-wise, so, or would, can we not meet their needs? Yeah. I'm so sorry, I'm, I'm gonna, just thinking of this like a business. The, I'm going to stay away from It's not a business, so statutory, you can't do that type of thing. Okay. You don't have money to give because the state gives you money to run your budget that's approved by the voters. It's state money that comes in. Right. And so when we go through our audited of our stats reports that become in the end of August, if we do something that's deemed a non-educational expense, the, there will be a penalty to you as a school district, and then there will be funds that the town of Middlesex will have to develop on its own. So like the select board could do that, but you couldn't. All right. So I was just, I mean, that was something I was trying to, I mean, if we had five more students, our budget problems would look much less dire. If we had seven more students, we wouldn't have any budget problems, as far as I can tell, because from counting up the numbers of students, it seems like we would still be within sort of the, the maximum number of students per classroom. So I was just thinking, how could we attract students here? And I think it also would depend on the age of the students. Like if we got seven first graders, I think that would be a problem. I mean, all we would welcome time. them, right? But yeah. right, like all at the same time, to ha right? Because there's already 21 maybe in that class, and so that would push it to 28. And mm -hmm. so, uh, so it's eight students. I mean, more students is helpful, but it's, um, yeah. I think it's the ongoing looking at the population trend, like over the next five years. It's not like seven students right now. No, I agree. I was just trying to think, like, what, what else can we look at? And so yeah. that's where that question came from, is me trying to figure out, like, could, could we actually shoot ourselves in the foot if we tried to invite more students here? I'm sorry, I just think of, like, I don't know. I think of things like a business, even though this is not a business, I get that. But, and the other thing that I was thinking of would be healthcare costs. 
and I don't know if we contract out, do we pay our own health care costs, but we just um, like, you know, some so company our, administers it? So we are part of Vermont Education Hire um, Health Care Initiative, it's known as VHI. All, it's a self-insured that all okay. schools are part of. So it's like part of the, the VSC is part of that as well? Uh, the VSC is not part of that. They're part of something else. Okay. Um, it, it, it's about the second or third largest healthcare consortium in the state. And state it's self-insured. It's self-insured. And actually, if you've heard, the governor next year will be taking over the negotiations and running of that. Oh, I had not, heard not the governor, but the state government will be doing that <coughs> instead of local districts. So our health care increase, which is one of the questions you had later, which I've been saying since is 12%. We're locked into that. Okay. I mean, you know, for next year. So we're actually losing because of people changing their enrollment status. The cost for health care is decreasing by $13,000 for in this next budget. And that's right. in there. So the other part you asked was what's the cost of tier two services. So looking at all the people that are employed, looking at the people and the amount of them that are employed for the different positions to do that work. And Amy's going to go over it. The total cost of tier two services is about $253,000. And so that's going to be ESTs and things like that? ESTs, kids who need... Uh, she's, Amy's going to explain that. Okay. I'm going to let Amy go with all that because she has the program inside of it. So you, we you have... still want the HO1 information? Well, it sounds like we couldn't yeah. really use it anyway, so... Okay. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Let me turn to it. It's okay. Um, so we have uh, a reading interventionist that does both boost as well as EST. You know, great news is that we're seeing more and more kids uh, shift from kind of the rinse and repeat cycle to actually exiting um, boost before they have to um, are required to get a EST. So that's a very positive thing. Um, she sees 13 students on her caseload right now, and those will be shifting um, because of exits. Um, we also have a math intervention in a similar kind of model. Um, right now, that position is split a little. He sees 10. Uh, plus supports um, one grade level's uh, math for Tier 1 um, because of the intensive needs in that room. Um, our student support specialist, um, he actively is seeing approximately six to eight students on um, a regular basis for check-in, check-outs, um, some behavior monitoring, that type of thing, but is also doing whole school consultative weekly uh, work with teachers and is developing behavior plans, that type of thing, and is our fallback when um, there's a tier three need uh, that needs to be overseen. And then finally, um, our MTSS coordinator is currently seeing 10 um, students uh, working ha uh, half time and um, also doing specific work with students at recess um, that ranges from uh, push in with executive functioning work to strategy building um, as well as collaboration with classroom teachers. Um, she's also supporting uh, grade one math um, to help with some of the um, habits of learning type of thing with students. Uh, in addition to that, there's also support that's given with refining our SSTs and our ESTs. And some of those are new positions, right? Like the MTSS position we added this year. Right. Um, and I will say that was critical in our first few months as we were taking on some stu uh, new student needs. Mm -hmm. so. Are you pretty happy with your the system that you have right now for dealing with kids in Tier 2 and above? I think we're in a good spot that allows us to be reflexive to where students are and to also um, effectively move them forward. So I think uh, there's things that are still being developed within MTSS. Uh, she's looking at doing some clubs around some of the executive function building and doing more uh, small group work as opposed to one-on-one. -on -one. But those needs uh, were just kind of getting to a point in the year that um, our system, because um, her use has been deployed into other areas of high need, we're finally getting back to that tier two zone. But uh, we kind of encountered the same thing with uh, the student support specialist also. Um, but that was part of the design 
is really that we could really handle as a system uh, strategically ha taking on kids with high needs that were not expected. So. Even I remember last year it was reported that it was either 20 or 25 percent of our students were on ESTs, uh -huh. uh, which if I remember, Bill, you said that that was compared to roughly on average like 5 percent of students across the SU. Is, are we, do you have a sense of, uh, of like new numbers or are we still at that? Um, I would have to look them up. I mean, there's several things that are encompassed within ESTs. I mean, there can be speech and language services that are, um, that are separate from IEPs that are sort of gathered up in that sort of way. Um, I do feel like we are having more success in not having kids get to the point of needing an EST, which is really that point where you're trying to decide, do they need a deeper eval or not? Um, so I think it's good news that we're having several kids um, kind of get back up to a grade level and not need additional services. Do you think you have adequate resources? Um, I, th I feel like the, our MTSS system is really working. So the next, next question was, what are, can we get more detail about the services at the Romney, uh, that the Romney school purchases through their central office assessment, WCSU assessment. So um, this is something that's been in the town report for a couple of years. Um, and so I made, I brought a copy of it with me that this is last year's page. We haven't created one for this year because of where we are in the merge budget piece. Um, so you can, the numbers aren't correct for the amount of share, but you can see the list of what comes from the different major categories and the costs last year through last year's assessment. Um, so you can see, I, I thought it was probably the easiest and best way to answer your question, mm -hmm. Allison, was Great, to say you. here's a list of everything that happens that way. I do want to point out through technology services almost, because uh, we're talking about technology in a little bit, um, we buy most of our software system-wide. There are some things that are done at each school, but very little. Uh, so within that technology services is a software charge. And that's something new this year, just because it's it's cheaper for us to buy it in larger quantities. Buy access. Um, your next question, your third question was, what's the twenty-five thousand dollars increase in paraeducator salary under instruction? And it actually wasn't uh, increased. And I think this was how why I wanted to explain the columns. It's under instruction. There's actually a, it's being reduced from this current budget year of fifty-eight thousand to thirty-six thousand three hundred next year under instructional services. And it was budgeted at that this year, but projected to be lower 30. because uh, the teacher that was doing part time. About, Got about a 0.18 FTE decided not, not to do it. We were able to take care of the student need without refilling that position. Okay, great. Okay. And we'll continue on in yeah, the future. Yeah, yeah that's okay. where we're going in the future. Okay. Um, I went over the four columns again. Um, did I explain that yeah, enough? No, thank you very much. Okay. You asked about a principal split with Doty, <clears throat> has been proposed, been proposed for many years. That's come back and forth. There's a school quality regulation that says if there's over a total over a total of F, of 10 FTEs or greater in a school, you must have one principal, full-time principal. Both Doty and Romney have one full-time principal, have over that number of FTEs of teachers. It doesn't count paraeducators. And so that regulation requires that we have one full-time principal at each. It actually made Doty, two years ago, we went through our equality review, having, they used to have a teaching principal and we had to go to a full-time principal. And that's, what's the governing law, law or body for that? Uh, it's the education quality standards, which are done by their- so it's Vermont law. It's, for, it's, it's a regulation that's called for by Vermont law. Okay. Not the individual piece, because it calls for the regulations to be set by the state school board. I mean, there's like, there's hundreds. I mean, we could probably go into 200 different pieces there in the quality standards. Okay. Yeah. But it's a legal requirement rather yeah. than a recommendation. It's a legal requirement. Thank you. <clears throat> I mean, regulation calls has the same powers. It makes sense. I didn't really, it seems sort of 
it didn't seem possible that one, I mean, Amy works like, I don't know, all the time as far as I can tell. And I don't know the principal of Doty, but I imagine he's plenty busy. So it doesn't really seem like you could possibly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, uh, para salaries in various categories seem low. How can we get a feel for where the para salaries? So I'm going to map you back to the budget. Mm -hmm. So um, the para education salaries are in a couple of places within the budget, and the reason for that to be most the majority of the para educators are under the instructional services for special education on page 11. Yeah. But our para educators perform duties which are not allowed reimbursable and cannot run through the special ed budget. Okay, so that's why there's bits and pieces in them all over the place. You got it. And then the healthcare also gets broken up. Bomb. You got it. Okay, great. We take the FTEs, and if you looked at our personnel spreadsheet, you would see how we were down the hundreds of FTEs. Okay. To make sure that we meet all the federal requirements on special ed reimbursement. <coughs> okay. And they do time studies, right? Yep, twice a year. So. Um, the amount. Based on the time study that our pairs spend for non-special education, is it in line with other schools? Pretty much. I and mean, is it mostly contractually based? So, like, no, it's mainly it's it, different schools have different amounts of duties and how they program the duties that the principals have the leeway to make that work as long as we can make it work in the budget. Um, we don't we don't have something in our ESP contract that says. With a paraeducator, we have a lot of leeway in the conditions, working conditions. So Besides I guess I mean, like, if there's something in the teacher's contract, like um, teachers get a, a duty-free lunch at the time their students eat lunch, well, that basically means you have right. to Right. Ours doesn't say at that. I don't it's believe like it says that. at that time, but we have a duty-free lunch. We also have a planning period. That's a lot of times why those... Yep. And that would be used. then the whole SU-wide has that same amount of time. Uh, like um, prep and um, lunch would be the same, I roughly. I, roughly, but I can't. Yeah, I can't even really say roughly because it the runs a little. Get down to minutes. It doesn't. No. Okay. We made it a nice agreement. Our teachers okay. and our ESP have been. We found a way that it could work for both to stay away from minutes and hours. We right. actually work on a con contracted week, thirty-seven and a half hour weeks. That way, it gives flexibility. If I'm a teacher and I don't have anything to do at the end of the day, I mean, I have plenty to do. But right. if I've got to go, if I'm a parent and I need to get yep. Megan, my daughter, to an appointment and school ends at three thirty-five and I got to leave at three forty, and I don't have an IEP meeting to be at, I can go. I don't need to wait till right. our clock says, you know, until yep. you know, where it works in most schools. Hey, and it just works, and that's what gets us our Wednesday afternoons to be longer. Yep. Great. So we can do more because people, everyone agreed we needed more time for our, media, our professional development planning time. Mm -hmm. so. so the regular ed um, salaries for pairs is roughly in line with other schools, other elementary schools. I'm not sure what you're asking. Are you so. asking total or per para? Uh, total. For paras or for teachers? Paras. For paras. She's paras. Okay, so for paras, we have, um, I'm going to give you some figures here about paraeducators. Um, I'm going to write it up here because I only have one sheet. This is literally today. <coughs> um, if I look at the different schools, I'll do this afterwards. So, louder than usual. Is there something special the going on? There's uh, a basketball game going okay. on, yeah. <laughs> That explains all the cars. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Not so many people going on. That's what I have yeah. to. <laughs> <laughs> Thankfully, I don't know. I like, what?
Yeah, that's not clear, Paul. That number you just wrote. Six? I do that a lot. Great, Six. okay, thank you. No, no, thank you, Chris. Yeah. So I wanted to give you some data um, and tell you some things that are happening. So this is currently, right now, and I can tell you what's gonna happen in budget, at least at one of the schools. So we've been looking a lot at BI, and I put pairs and BIs up here. So behavior interventionists. Um, so we've been looking a lot at, at that and what are, what are paraeducators doing, as you know from the summer work we've been talking about, who's doing instruction and that there are many studies that tell us that a highly qualified teacher doing instruction instead of a paraeducator gets better results. I mean, there are multiple, there's meta-analysis that's done on that. Um, so that's not just a couple of studies. UVM is one of many places that that's happened. I could name others as well. Um, but at U32, just to read this, there's 114 students on an IEP. There are nine SPED teachers and there are 23 paras. Next year, to get in their budget, the, 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 when the board told us we needed to get below 3%, we're cutting seven paras for next year. So that number will be reduced by seven. Um, the Calus, there are 19 students on IEPs, two SPED teachers, and five to 28. Three of these are behavior interventions from Washington County Mental Health. Um, and uh, Calus, two years ago, reduced five pairs and went to two teachers to provide instruction. Did they go up from one teacher to two? Yep, they okay. went up from one. They, they, it's about two and a quarter cost-wise. I'm just giving you cost, okay? Yep. Yep. Because it's about, remember I said it's about $50,000 total cost for a paraeducator and about seventy five dollars to $80,000 for a teacher total cost. And when U32 is reducing the pairs by seven, yeah. is that being done um, in collaboration with the special educators, the principals, and the special ed director from central office? Or is it? At the building special ed director as well. So all of them are involved in like so, reviewing the IEP, de determining so how to make that shift? Some yes, some no, because the high school runs a little differently yep. than the elementary schools. But Kelly's done this work. She, at Cal's when we did that's exactly what happened. Okay. The special educator sat down, looked at student need, yep. how can we, and they said, wait a minute, we can get another teacher here and, and change some roles. Okay, great. Okay. Berlin has 48, and I should put a star by Berlin. Berlin has three um, DC, um, I wanna say this nicely, um, has three uh, youth homes for students that are wards of the state. So many of these 15 are coming through, are state placed students that have a BI or two BIs with them because they're yeah. wards of DCF in the state. So we have youth home. We have three youth homes in Berlin. Some of those are up here too. So when you see Berlin's numbers, you kind of have to understand that. We also have someone that's now a .6 FTE working through central office for all the state place students. Um, Doty has 14, 1.25 SPED teachers, and five pair pairs. Most of these are BIs through Washington County Mental Health. Um, EMES, 34, three SPED teachers. They did a big reduction, and then this past year, we've had a couple kids move in that with intense needs, same as Romney. And Romney this year, we've had some kids move in, as Amy was talking to earlier, intense needs. So we've had to do that. Um, but at EMS, Doty, Berlin, Callis, and now U32 starting next year, um, all instruction will be provided by teachers. Parents will be doing either, um, will either be doing safety, or student needs due to physical services. So just at U32, um, mm -hmm. so is there gonna be instructional duties shifted from Paris to teachers? Yep, yep. we're moving to teachers. We started doing that some this year. We hired an additional teacher in the middle school who has a literacy focus uh, that's doing some of that. We're also working, Kelly and Jen, are working with the principals and the case managers in their monthly meetings looking at specialization of content areas that they can support so we can have multiple teachers in the classroom supporting kids. And so are these numbers in terms of teachers stable or are they going to change next year? Like those those are stable. Thing? Those teacher numbers are stable. So the paraeducators then and MBIs, or they just change the 
name of the role or? Uh, the BI, there's some, when I say a BI, I'm gonna say it's someone contracted from the outside, usually Washington County Mental Health or Green Mountain Associates, as you know, Jen, because you've seen both here. Um, and then the paraeducators are gonna, we're gonna probably get more into that. At U32 right now, we have two gentlemen who are doing BI type work. Mm -hmm. But they're not, um, they're not outside folks, they're, they were hired by U32. They were hired by U32. We'd actually rather have our own if we didn't have to go with outside folks. Mm -hmm. um, we think that that's a better, a better model and we can actually provide more stability and employment and have folks working at a higher level. The hard part is, um, it's frankly the uptime to get the system up and running. I need someone that can spend a year to put the program together. Kelly's got it conceptually modeled and we're actually trying to talk across issues if there's a way we can do that because we'd like to all have them hired within our own organization instead of contracting because it's a higher cost to contract out. Okay. So I guess maybe I'm unclear about, did, or I didn't hear clearly, did you say you're not going to have paraeducators? Providing at? instruction providing instruction, but they would be there for other roles. Yep, for, for safety or physical safety. needs. But that number will remain the same, the numbers up there? Uh, as I said, U32 to get there is cutting the 23 yeah. by seven. But otherwise. Yeah. yeah. Did we increase Paris this year because of need, this particular student need? Uh, there is, we have an outside contract. Okay. Based on the Increased need from the mission, and that's part of the nine. Yeah. yeah. So Kelly started today working with the question that you had with the special educators here at Romney to do an okay. audit of all the student needs Great. and to say, well, how could we maybe do this better? And she's done that. We've done that. It happens, seems to happen about every two to three years. Sometimes it happens because of budget. Sometimes it happens because we see things changing and start to ask why. What you have to really do is do a diagnosis and it's a, everyone at the table is saying, we don't know what the ending's gonna be and what it is, but let's look at all these student needs because what happens, and out of no ill will of anybody, is you get focused on the individual kid. And it's hard to pull yourself up and say, wait a minute, I gotta look at all these kids across the whole spectrum yep. and then say, is there a better way to combine it? Because one of the things that we know is that it's, rare that individual instruction for a kid is better than small group instruction. Mm -hmm. The collective knowledge at the table of multiple kids gives more power for learning than an individual one-on-one -on -one tutor. Um, from our last meeting to this one, I feel much better about that plan and having the audit and having the director of special ed involved and looking big picture. Yeah, we just don't know the result. Versus like, us just saying a number, you know what I mean? We just, yeah, and there, I mean, there have been years where we've had a board say, here's yeah. the number, and then we've had to, okay, we gotta live with this, how do we make it work? Yeah. So, I mean, it's gone both ways, I, I wanna be transparent about that, and that's sometimes why we've had to get in and say, okay, let's redesign the how we provide services. Mm -hmm. I think the other thing I would just want the board to be aware of is that you know, 10 years ago, much of what I would see a special educator doing would be, you know, meeting with families to refine their IEP. That was a once a year kind of thing. And then, you know, helping with the instruction and monitoring and that sort of thing. And um, the number of uh, students that have an array of needs is really causing um, so many more team meetings around kids to get all of the um, consulting professionals around the table, um, pull in therapists to um, really make sure that we're taking good care of the whole kid. Um, and so a lot more of their time isn't just like pulling families in for the IEP. It's really like monthly check-ins on kids with therapists, you know, OT, you know, um, academics, behavior, you know, there's, our whole conference room will be sometimes filled with people um, and that are meeting monthly. So I just, you know, just want to highlight that that is some of the work that special educators are now having to coordinate and plan to ensure that kids are getting the right um, care. Your next question was about the computers. 
these, um, there's computers for children. It doesn't seem like the tech of the scale is noted in the budget. So we have a five-year replacement cycle that looks something like this. This is all the hardware, including phone systems and copiers in the building. And it averages a five-year replacement cycle. Um, the total cost, if you had to replace everything today, is about $215,000 in the building for all the technology. Uh, like I said, phones, computers, copiers. Um, that that is just straight hardware. Um, there's a $40,000 piece that comes over every year into the computer fund transfer. And that's coming through central office, right? Nope. No. Nope. That's coming. If you look down and fund transfer out, you'll see computer maintenance. Okay. And one of the things we made, I made an agreement with the board when I first came in here. I said, if you let me make a, because I had done this, because as you all probably recall, a long time ago, I used to be a tech director. I said, if we, if we do this right, we do the right plan. And because the cost of technology is always going down or at least staying flat, we'll either grow or stay constant with the same costs. So actually, since $40,000 today is cheaper for you than it was two years ago or last year because of rates of inflation, we're actually lowering your overall cost of technology, keeping it flat at $40,000. Um, so we're able to keep everything in a five-year, averaging a five-year replacement cycle. We're right now, hopefully on February vacation, replacing all the phone system in this building. It's over eight years old and to make E911 to the room, we can make E99, E911 compliant to the building, but not to the room. We have to replace our phone system. And, and that's a requirement of safety protocols. It's not a law or statute, but it's one that gets pretty public. I remember Brian, you and I mm -hmm. had some conversation about that. So we're replacing the phone. Um, we're doing that replacement this February, but uh, overall you can see some years we pay less out and some years we pay more out and that's why we use that fund. So in some years it's gaining money and some year every building's doing that. Uh, we have a constant cost for technology and we have a plan that looks like this that Keith McMartin manages and works with Lori Bebo to make sure the numbers all flow correctly. Okay. Bill, how much of that, <clears throat> so, um, Looks like it's the seventy-five thousand plus the forty. No, it's um, just the forty. It's just the forty, but then the technology. I'm sorry, it's technology services. Um, so, how much of that is the kids' computers, and how much of it is uh, staff and faculty? All. And, okay, so the kids have Chromebooks. Yep. How much? So the forty thousand is Chromebooks only. No, it's every piece of technology that's, that's in I'm this sorry, building. What you say. So, how much of it is the Chromebook? Uh, the total cost for all the Chromebooks across the whole system is $51,000 over five years. Quoten's trying to get, uh, I, I think what you're asking is what percent, roughly, what percentage of our technology costs is, are represented by providing our children with actual computers? Is that what you're saying? That is saying? exactly it. Thank you very much. I would say roughly, if you take 15 divided by 200,000, you're at about 25%. No, so you think that's about right then? Oh, it, yeah, right now, all of learning, whether, you know, whether everything that's moving for curriculum and, and learning is online, that's where it's moving to. And it has already moved there, actually. And so we have to teach our kids how to live in that environment. We don't want them in that environment all the time. We don't want to be using technology all the time for their instruction, but it is part of their environment. It it's true. It's also useful to know. I don't know if you yeah. saw the New York Times series, but that the tech giants in Silicon Valley are the ones who are sending their kids to Waldorf and really keeping away from the tech. And so I would like us to keep both an awareness that kids should know how to program, they should know how to turn it on, they should know how to operate it, but also spend. Uh, make sure that whatever time is spent on there is absolutely needs to be done on the computer. Um, and that's not the case right now. Probably in the elementary school, it is more. Certainly not in high school. Um, is it moved online because that's where the um, providers have put it? Like the program providers, whatever um, program we Yeah, have. I mean, yes, and our kids are competing across the world. Mm -hmm. I feel and like we're need. getting more into programming than budget, unless there's a budget. No, I was uh, I, I, Thank you, I do answer my question. Yeah, yeah, yeah I mean, okay. it, it is. I think I mean, the that's, programming discussion would be great, but maybe for... Um, an agenda item on yeah. another meeting. Okay. We are, yeah, that's where it's going. I think Kyle is going to say. I'm just, I'm looking at this sheet. Yeah. This. I'm probably, so the 75,000 for tech services, that's for central office computers. No. We run most of our, 
almost every server that services everything across all the schools runs through that system. So we have a server farm sitting at U32, just as like you do with a state. Yeah. I don't know where it sits, if it sits on state 119 State Street or somewhere else. Yeah. But you access that from all over the place, Kyle, and your work as an assistant AG. Are, I'm not there anymore. But, yeah. Okay, yeah. wherever you're at as, as a job, you probably have the same thing with the job. Yeah. Most most computing's gone to cloud computing. Yeah. We've actually get, are trying to get less and less on our own server farm and more and more offsite because they give us better security and better protection for student data. Okay, than we I can was just do. trying to mesh the numbers. Right. So that's on top of the 40. And then I'm also just struggling with this sheet generally because it talks about the 252,000 that's assessed to run me. But back in the after when I add up these numbers, it's yeah. over 500. And then at the top, it talks about Rumney is 11% of the overall budget. I thought the overall central office was more like 10 million, so 11% would be a million. So I'm just, is it 250, is it 500, is it a million? Um, so I grabbed this from last year's town meeting report okay. to get to answer the services question. I didn't come prep to get into that piece from last year. Yeah. I can tell you for this year, what happens is, is there's a lot of double counting because of the way we're currently governed right now with individual districts and the SU. So for, let me just give you an example. An example would be special education. In special education, we have uh, approximately five million of our total eight and a half million dollar budget for this year. And I'm doing this all from memory. So if my numbers are off, get the concept, not the numbers, okay? Um, approximately about five, five million of them, let's call it nine to make it easy, so five nights, is gross cost for special education. Let's say we get three, because it's about 54%. It's, it's a little greater than that because of different costs, but let's just call it 50 55% of that, we get revenue in to offset those costs, and then the net cost comes to Romney. Well, it's a double budget because you got to count it in the Romney budget and then you got to count it in the SU budget. Yeah. So, like when we go to merge, things are going to look up different, and the numbers aren't going to add up because of the way which in which we count them. Well, hopefully we don't merge. Yeah, <laughs> I hear you. I, I'm under an order right now to do the work, so I'm doing the work. I understand where you're this at. This guy's trying to get you out. Of that. I know he's trying to get me out of that. <laughs> So the, um, the, the piece with these, I would have to go look at the, I want to look at the top of this, um, and I'd want to have my SU budget with me, which I don't have with me for this year. One of the things that happened last year is that the supervisory union board agreed to do things, to go away from fee for service to just straight assessments for everything, transportation, special education, and everything that runs through the SU office. So we no longer do a fee for service. We do what's the percentage of kids. Let's say there's 15% of the kids in the SU are in this building. That's what gets caught, 15% of the overall cost, you know, once you take out back out the revenue, is what Rummy pays. And if there's more services, cost for special education if it spikes for Rumney, good deal that year. If it goes down and there aren't services, sorry, but you know, and it, what did we want to make it a more constant slope. That's what we were getting to so many peaks and valleys it was hard to budget for. Yep. Okay, thanks. When did we stop pulling fee for service? Uh, last two years ago, last year was the first year for assessment. So that kind of aligns too. I mean, I'm sorry, that aligns doesn't it, with the notion that like we're responsible for all our students. Yep. Fee for service is sort of like we got your own, our own. Yeah. Go get yours. Yeah. So we were already doing pretty much what uh, the legislature. So we, we were under an order that. from 2011 to do that. It yeah. took us a while to get there. Okay. We had should have there's going Charlie if you go back to what the SU services are that mm -hmm. were done under Act 153 which really changed a, put a lot of centralization of services into mm -hmm. the SU we have been slowly moving to those requirements that okay. we've been needing well to do. 2011 was transportation and special ed it wasn't everything uh, there were a by lot of, 2011 was it it was supposed to happen right after that. Oh. So we move, I mean, curriculum technology, human resources, data analysis, all that went to the authority of the supervisory union. Okay. And went away from the mm -hmm. local boards. Did that answer your question? Yeah, and it sounds like the 
ultimate number is 11 percent of what eight and a half million minus what we get from yeah. the federal government yeah so yeah i mean there's fed yeah there's fed and state money yeah. it's i did if i had i'd give it to you right now kyle and if you want it call me i'll be glad to get it i just have to i don't have it with me okay or it's somewhere on this computer but it would take me a little while um, the next question was about clerical salary versus teacher salary. Um, it, it's hard to see it in the budget, but we have 1.4 clerical st salary in the off in this in the office okay. between the two personnel that work in there. So the lowest the lowest teacher salary right now for this current for no I did next year. Next year the lowest teacher salary is fifty two thousand sixty nine dollars. That that's salary. Okay. Total cost, I was going to go there. Okay. Total cost is 66749 And I want to just put a star on whenever I say total cost. Remember, that depends on the biggest factor is what health benefits the teachers elect like to use or the staff. Because run me here, you provide your E, because you're not in a association for par for support staff they're non-bargaining you could choose to do something different than but you choose to do follow the esp agreement that we do with the other schools that have people in the esp union so, so go, ahead. Ahead. go ahead so if we see like for instance the preschool program salary teacher that's just because it's less than full-time you've got it All exactly right. that's where i was going to go because what i was going to say that again in your town report you have a list of salaries and at first I looked at it smart, I'm like, they've got all this information. But then I said, oh, I can see how it can be hard because there's some FTEs, there's some people in here that are like 0.6. Okay. You know, so if I think, or, um, you know, you know, we have many teachers that are fractional. Yeah. So, okay. uh, Lauren Caswell, 0.6. Jen, 0.6. So if you look at their teacher salary versus, a, it looks like, well, wait a minute, that's less. Okay. So the, um, the clerical staff, what you have in next year's budget is um, for 1.0 clerical staff is 40,300 with a total cost of 61,825. Okay. Okay. I think I went over the healthcare, which was number nine. Number 10, you said the transportation costs have increased by 30. It's actually going down by $4,000 from this year's yeah, that's budget. That's what you said. That's what you said at the beginning of the meeting, but. Yeah, it's, so if I go to if I go to page 11, I believe that's where transportation is. You'll see students transportation SU. Mm -hmm. The projected cost for this year and the budgeted cost is 106,421. Does everyone see that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I've seen well, it's it up from 30 again. last year. Yeah. Yes. So it's up 30 from last year. Though. From the year before, I'll explain that one. I can see I brought that explanation on that. And so for next year, because the percentage of students is going down for Romney compared to the SU, so your cost will actually go down, even though there's a fuel surcharge increase. So you'll have $102,000 budgeted for transportation services. Okay. Um, the reason that it went up so much is we started a new contract. And we went to transportation, just as I said, we're assessing instead of fee, we're just assessing by, um, by ADM. Yep. Okay. Oh, equalized. Sorry. It's equalized pupils. I said that wrong. And then the last question you have, I've been told by community about Spanish. Um, we haven't done any data collection on anything on, uh, on, you know, where people have moved to Middlesex because we have Spanish. I want to be the first to say, I'd like to have language programs in all our elementary schools it's the tough place we get we've gotten in other schools around um around budget you know where we are with budget and having to cut programs and i mean for me spanish has a a memory a long memory because my spanish teachers want to found, found my auditory dyslexia she's the one who said hey we got something going on here with this guy so because i couldn't speak it but i could decode it I can visually decode anything. I can't. You, you, everyone's gotten used to my speech patterns, which is just part of me. I don't know if there are other questions from that. So, can I just make sure if we go over, it's not. There's no. It's over this threshold. Mm -hmm. Over so, the threshold, it's it's scaled, right? So if we went over by one dollar, we we would pay one tenth as uh, if we went over by ten dollars, right? If there's not like a you so pay a dollar, every dollar that we are over the threshold, we pay in taxes to we have to raise the um, Vermont Education Fund. So it's right. all money that we have no control over. 
So it's so yeah, it, Chris has got it right. The, the simple explanation is for every dollar you ra that you go over, you have to raise an additional dollar or have two. And that goes back into the Ed Fund, as, as uh, Caroline was saying. As in my memo that I started the budget with, right now you're $38,230 over the threshold. That's without the energy savings mm -hmm. I told you about, because I wrote this memo before I knew mm -hmm. about that. Um, and that would be a 1.4 cents uh, increase to penalty that would go to the um, Middlesex taxpayers. I would also tell you that right now, the budget that you have in front of you is a eight hundredths of a percent increase. And without the penalty is almost the same tax rate as last year. Um, with the increase, if you were to be locally, if you were to stay in the same governance that you're in currently, so you were separate districts, um, Middlesex would see an increase to their overall, because remember, I've got to combine U32 into here, okay? So if you were not to merge, you would have a $1.90 tax rate. If you were to merge, it'd be a $1.82 or an eight cents savings. And that's with CLA, with the new CLAs. Last time I gave you a higher number because the new CLAs are in, your CLA went down. Why do we, why is it less if we merge? I can't. Because you have to look at the overall, um, it's, it's the, you, the tax rate gets set on the education spending per pu equalized pupil for, uh, ac for across the whole district. And so that's lower than what the total, the total equalized spending is for the students that come from Middlesex that are educated at Youth Area 2 plus the Romney. The, the simple explanation is Callis and Worcester and Berlin and East Montpelier all take on a chunk of our bond also. And then we take on a chunk of East Montpelier and Berlin's, but when it's all, all said and done, East Montpelier's taxes go way down. Actually, no, they so don't. So it's dividing up the, it's taking the expenses of everybody and dividing. They don't go, Middlesex has the, the greatest drop. Percentage-wise? Both, percentage and in, and in tax rate. Uh, I'd be very interested in seeing those numbers. Yeah. Can somebody tell me what I hear this? I know the dollar ninety and dollar eighty two, but per what? Yeah. Per, per hundred of assessed value. value. Okay. Of the per hundred dollars. Per hundred dollars of assessed value. Okay. All right. Of the home. Right. Of the home. Right. Of the, right. Of the home. Right. Of the home is twenty dollars per thousand. Three hundred thousand. Then it'd be sixty dollars, roughly. So for a hundred thousand dollar house, yeah, a, a eight cents decrease is an eighty dollar decrease in taxes per hundred thousand. Per hundred thousand. Okay. Per hundred thousand. Well, right. Except that the impact will be felt by those uh, who um, income have the or income sensitivities. Right, and I can tell you that that for reason, instance, you know, Char Charlie's right. For the, we'll be getting the benefit of shifting the, the vote that we took on into others who didn't get the vote. Say that again. I missed. For those of us who are not income sensitized and pay full vote, mm -hmm. we will get the benefit of shifting on to another population the cost of what we were able to vote for because the improvements we made to our voting. If there's a merger. If there's a merger. It won't affect where it may if at the margin it won't uh, it may at the margin effect, but I think, correct me if I'm wrong, Bill, it won't affect those who are income sensitized. Um, well, there's two, there's, it's a yes and no, <laughs> Charlie. You, you've, got, you've got the theme, the up to $47,000 of, uh, below $47,000 of annual income, you're correct. If there's a slide, there's a sliding scale between 47, that's why I was getting my book open here, because I have these figures with me. Um, <laughs> Middlesex has um, about 43% of the residents don't have any income adjustment. 13% mm -hmm. uh, are below the 47,000. Okay. And then 44% have a sliding scale, and it's between $141,000 of annual income to 47. And it's a, it, the best way to just say it easily is a sliding scale based on where you are and some ratios that are in there for how mm -hmm. much you'll see that. 
Right. And, and you've got the idea. Yeah. yeah. I, mean, I used to do it for years in the back department. I kind of know the whole routine. Yeah. So these numbers, Bill, this is specific to the budgets that are pro proposed just for next year, and this includes the penalty that Millsex has if there's a, yep. not a merger, which comes out if there is a merger, but in all the years after that, it's still on the whole, we're taking on a, a larger chunk of other towns' debt than what East Montpelier takes on of other towns' debt compared to what it currently has. So I'm going to be really direct with you, Kyle. I haven't looked at the debt because what drives more of the cost is the spending per pupil. That's what I look at. And did that go yeah. down? And that's because, and I know that you guys have, and that's fine. I'm not trying to say it isn't. I'm not saying you're right or not. I just don't look at it that way. I look at it as the, the spending per pupil and that because that's what drives the tax rate. And the debt goes into that calculation. The debt goes right? into that calculation. Mm -hmm. And it changes the threshold level because people have different, all your debt was forgiven. So when you look at the tech to get to the threshold, mm -hmm. that that cost, even though Middlesex residents pay for that debt, it's not counted against you for your spending per pupil. Where in East Montpelier, their building, when they did their bond, only 80% of it was allowed for, to, to be forgiven for calculating the threshold. So 20% of their bond payment comes in to count against their their okay. threshold level for spending equal for ed spending for equalized people for the threshold mm -hmm. and what we pay as a penalty is it based on what's budgeted or the actuals at the end of the year so this is what even know yet? yeah it, it is based on what's budgeted but that i can't say that that threshold calculation is a hundred percent I have to wait to the end of the legislative session, which you all know the last bill that usually comes out is the ed spending and ed tax rate bills. So until those are set, these are our best estimates along with information that we're getting from AOE. So if we... Because they could change the amount of uh, yield for what a dollar yields per pupil and it would change all that calculation right away. So last year we thought we were right up with it. Remember last tax season, for yeah. those of you who are on the board here, we thought we spent like within a dollar of it. We were $32,000 away when it came to June. So, I mean, it, it, I, so we just can't do any better. We can't do any can pay. better modeling either way. And it could go either way. I just, I, I don't know. And Lori is, I mean, she's a pro at this stuff, so. So we can get underneath the thresholds and still pay tonight up. and still be. Go above it. Right. And, and or I mean and you have, go above it and be below it. And, and I would and I would yeah, tell you more yeah, yeah. And I would tell you this. You have less control of that than the rest of the schools in Vermont do. Because right now we still don't have stable equalized pupils from the state of Vermont. They haven't been able to give us equalized pupils yet. That right there could swing stuff. We are very confident in the Romney numbers and all our issue, but we know there are three supervisor unions that are still out trying to submit their data. So we don't have there's there's a last factor that comes in that that does an adjustment to get the equalized pupils to be equal to the real pupils. And that's a ratio that can come in and swing equalized pupils. I mean, just a thousand change on that number can change these threshold numbers. Is that, and, oh, sorry, go ahead. Is that information going to be available before we have to um, report to the clerk, town clerk's office? Um, well, we don't have to report to the town clerks because, as I've been saying, we're not ready. If we knew we were going to do a local budget today, I could not be ready for town meeting. Lori and I are off. We do not, even though we could post a warning, we could not get you a budget and get it printed and get it to the taxpayers. So we're, we're special meeting no matter which way we go for a budget. And I was saying that back in December. I mean, we, we, I've had to do a workflow analysis, and I think Laura, Laura and I meet at least two or three times a week on it of what we're doing and what we're not doing. And so we have just been following the work we're, we're working right now to pull things together. So the, the, the um, we have a lot of hours. I actually have a sick business manager now because she's been working oh, so hard. Uh -huh. She has a flu. Oh. She's been out for a week and a half, and I told her to go home today. I was like, go back home. I don't want it. She's the best hand sanitizer. <laughs> <laughs> I am healthy. <laughs> half my office is not. So what is, our, what is our deadline for having to vote on a budget for next year? Well, you don't. 
right now you don't have to vote on a budget. I was trying to get everyone from the boards, and we have a different timeline now because of the um, the ske interim scheduling hold for to fe to February to the third week in February for the transition board. We were trying to take this at this point, start working on a merge budget with those boards, with a merge with the transition board. Mm -hmm. So I was trying to have everybody, and you're the last one that doesn't have a budget that's ready to go to the transition board. So um, I'd like to finish that tonight, frankly, because yeah. um, we're trying to, we're already, we're already built templates and started to build everything into a merge budget. We're building the financial system on the backside right now electronically, because we have to. We're also having to move fiscal software right now to a new fiscal software. So by January 25th, we have to submit the budget to which we're moving to on that because of what the fiscal software is pushing us to do outside the merger law. So if there is a, um, a stay, not, not a scheduling stay, a, a stay on any uh, merger activity, um, when would we... When, sh when would we have to be voting on a budget? I mean, we're not going to be voting on at town meeting, right? At no, we're point. not going to be voting at town meeting. I'm just okay. going to explain so a lot more of that later on. So for the budget piece of it, I think once we, um, the conversation I had on Monday or Tuesday, frankly, I forget which day it was, was that we're currently still under the order from the uh, state school board of November 28th keep moving that we're, we have to merge and be in transition by July, become operational July 1, 2019. Um, so if that were to be stayed, then I would be, and we, you know, this is, and Chris, you were part of this decision of the executive committee, which I think everyone's bought into from all the boards, which was mm -hmm. build the budget so you can either pull them apart or put them back together. Mm -hmm. So we can pull them apart. We would then go from, a, we go to a 30, 40 days warning to a special meeting. Um, but I'd also want to check with, I mean, Chris Leopold and I have had some of these conversations as the attorney that's been helping us with all the merger and, you know, how do we pull this stuff apart if we need to and looking over all the warnings. So that's the best I can give you. I can't give you a date because I don't know if that's happening and when it does happen, when is that happening to build a schedule to do it? Mm -hmm. So, um, I will tell you that what I do know about budgets and how they work um, and electing budgets, I've been in dist work for districts that didn't run their budgets on town meeting day, they did in April. A anything past the end of April start to get really tough because you want at least one revote time with it before June 30th because if we get to June 30th and don't have a budget, we have to operate on 95% of this fiscal year's money. That also means that we don't give teachers we're in negotiation, so we may be giving letters of intent anyway, but my recommendation would be to the board, if you want to issue contracts, you can, but realize you'll be deficit spending and buy quite a bit. So you may want to only do letters of intent or not even give letters of intent. Those are things you'll have to think about without a budget. I just want to be, I'm not trying to scare you, I'm just trying to give you some of the reality, because I've been down these roads when I was working as a curriculum director. We had a couple of these in Hardwick where we lost the Hazen budget and we had to we had to start thinking about running at 95% of the overall budget. Um, just go back a, a little bit. Um, for the other SUs that you said hadn't gotten their information there um, to the state, um, so yeah. to the department, so that you could have a better sense of our numbers, do you have a sense as to when that will happen? I'm hoping it's this week. Um, there was a whole new data collection system from the Agency of Education this past fall for submitting student census information. So that new system, it really depended on what personnel you had to run data. Um, and I, these issues are, I mean, they're just, they don't have the staff. Like, luckily we have Michelle Sepka and we, we created that data manager position five years ago. So, I mean. I, I don't know, Chris, because no, just, I don't know. I mean, I'm that this way. It sounds like within a couple of weeks, we would think. I, so <clears throat> just things are just really, there, there's nothing, I've never I been hear, in a situation like this. I'm not well, well, I've just never been in a situation like this where we can't get data out of the agency right now. They're so understaffed. They have so many open positions. So it's just, it. I can't give you, I mean, they, we're missing tuition data. We're missing, we're, I can go through the litany list of things we're missing right now. 
that we're just making assumptions. It's a nice thing that we run the models on the back sides ourselves, so we feel pretty confident on our numbers. And we, Lori's, you know, those are things from years and years of spreadsheets we have going that we can kind of model ourselves. But we're talking about districts. What I want to give you is those are districts that don't do that type of stuff because they don't have the capacity to do it. So therefore, I don't know how fast they can submit data. Because some of, I mean, until a couple of years ago, there were some, some folks that didn't even have fiscal software in their issues. They were still doing it in ledger books. So for tonight, does it make sense to um, decide on the threshold piece and the um, priorities we talked about last time so that... So, so it's not last time we came up with, either we take the penalty, reduce staff, or we take from our capital fund. Right. And so then, like, Woden and I thought about it, and I was thinking about it, and we've done all this talking, and we've come back to, we can either take the penalty, <laughs> reduce staff, or take from our capital fund. So I feel like we need to figure out which of those, if any, we're going to do. And that's well, what we're Right. So, and I know we don't have exact numbers, but I would think in terms of um, morale for the school and focus for the educational leaders, we, we need to know what we're doing in in terms so, of the threshold. So we have, so we have a proposal right. now that only has a 30000 maybe $31,000. Yeah, let's call over. it that. Say let's 31, we take, take the, the 7000 take, take seven take the the And that was with 30000 um, a decrease in 30000 which was actually a decrease in 45000 to the capital yep. fund that we had planned uh, either two or three years ago to... to it was... To, so looking at that, I think, would be really important. And looking at the, um, didn't Bill send out something from um, I did the from Matt. From yeah, Matt like, Brian asked me to send out to everyone. So I just, I think it's, I think it's really good to look at. Um, so I guess for me, I would like to look at the facilities audit, vote if we are going to decrease by that 30. Mm -hmm. Because if we're not, I think, we owe it to our administrators to let them know tonight. And if we are doing that, then say that we vote on the 30, um, then we decide the rest of it. Either be over by that much or continue cutting by that much or whatever we end up doing. I just feel like tonight is, we. I, to me, I don't want it hanging. So I can't imagine how the staff and the administrators feel. Mm -hmm. Does that I make sense you. in terms of? Yeah. You know, I, it, I, uh, <laughs> um, frenzy at this time of year is usually driven by a town meeting and mm -hmm. getting a warning out and having to get the warning out. Um, I think we, um, I would favor getting a preliminary number and decide whether or not we uh, will go over or cut uh, to be under, um, but not finalize it until we have more final numbers, uh, which may be in a week, but at least get a fairly sturdy understanding of where, where we think we'll be going. So not finalize a budget, like right. not the 3 million, 100, whatever, right. but I think if we look at the first page of Bill's report. Page seven. Mm -hmm. Even if those numbers change, um, I think the conversation around these numbers will help if it ends up being off next time, say by $5,000, we still have gone through and really taken our priorities to the point of voting. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. like. So can I, I just want to give you a piece of climate. The piece of climate? Climate. climate. Okay. The longer you hold from making a decision, the, it's almost exponential, the climate effect exactly. you're having in the building. Exactly. And I'm not saying that for Romney. I'm just saying that I've been, when been through this before, the longer the board takes to make a decision, the more anxious people get. So I guess that's what I'm saying is let's just decide that piece tonight so that for people who maybe have a sense that their specific position might be one that we are discussing in terms of cuts, um, that we can just know tonight that it's off the table or it's what we're doing. Oh, I, I, that's fair. Okay. In terms of statement. Okay. So should we start with capital fund or with the penalty? Well, actually, I have one question. It's been that. bothering me. Um, there was this private school tuition on here for thirty-eight thousand or something like that. I thought I knew what that was last meeting, but I don't. I don't. Um, can we? In the budget. Um, yeah. yeah Hold on, let me look. I didn't that. think we had. It's toward the beginning, isn't it? Where is it? Yeah. Let me see if I can find it. Um, 
Is that a preschool? I remembered approving one, but that oh, that's preschool. So that's the school choice. That's okay. That's the preschool choice. Act one sixty six. From us to three thousand so ten hours. Three thousand okay. ten kids. All right. All right. That's the right about. The right I, number. I knew there was an answer that I wasn't gonna. <laughs> there we go. Um, so is there, you were going to say something, Alan? No, I just, I was, I mean, I agree with everything Carolyn said, and it's just a matter of where, like, where do we start by talking about whether or not we're willing to go over the... Well, I think it, the threshold, this is just me, I'll throw it out there. <coughs> talking about the threshold gives us really specifics, and I think the capital fund is the one. Um, my priority um, was the same as Chris of the 30000 I just want to go through now that I have Matt's um, detail and more of the emotional attachment to the things in there that haven't been done. I think looking at that 30 and 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 voting as a board of if that does make sense um, would be a good place to start because that could, depending how the vote went, that would impact the rest of it, the rest of the threshold, how much we're over by. Are we comfortable being over, let's say we're over by 20, if we only vote to decrease it by 10, th that changes the discussion. I, so at least the, then we're all on the same. Over by 100 this is a lot was different than I, I, absolutely. over by 30. Absolutely. Right. Okay. Yep. Yeah, no, that was good news when we got that. Was good news. Yeah. That was good. Well, but that 30 incorporates the 30 reduction in the capital. And a capital fund. Yeah, so that's already incorporated into the $31,000. Right, and I think that's what saying. Yeah. You should talk if that's what you want. Yeah. Right. How so, much are you putting in capital for next year? Right, so we had agreed, oh, I'm going to mess up the numbers. I think Brian has it better. In my head, we had agreed something around 120. I think it was. Last year, we reduced it to 90. 90. 90. And we we said for our priority we would rather pay sixty for next year. So that's actually sixty thousand less, roughly. Are my numbers way off? Right. You know, you're right. No, um, you're right on. You're right on. So now it's sixty thousand less adding to it. And there were people who had been on the board, like before I was, who really passionately spoke to us about do not cut there. Um, and we had a very um, specific. A facilities audit or a facilities report of what was needed and I remember feeling like they were all extremely important and I just want to make sure um, as much as of the choices that was the one I was most comfortable with that it's like let I think a vote just put something behind it um, you know, I'll just put another <laughs> know that right now the order is a merger and there's going to be a lot that happens between now and July 1, but if come July 1 merger happens, then whatever amount of money we're putting into that capital fund is just gone. And so... Uh, oh, is that how it happens? Actually, no. <laughs> well, it's gone from Romney. Explain. <laughs> so I will explain. Yeah. Um, in, in the next year's budget, you're correct, but the capital fund that is now established according to the opinion of Chris Leopold, there isn't actually statute that says this. There is on scholarships and endowments, but not on reserve fund balances. Mm -hmm. That reserve fund balances that were attached to a school for a specific, I'm just going to stay with capital, they're just here for Romney, would be, have to be used for the Romney school building. That's the reserve amount. But right. The budgeted amount is, I mean, it's basically, this is a long way of saying if the merger happens, it's not really our problem what that number is. And I just want to go back to the morale issue that, I mean, I, I'm here tonight because I heard there was discussion about cutting Spanish. There was discussion about going to one kindergarten teacher. And I don't know if that, those things are true or not, but that's not what, as a parent of three kids here, I want to hear. That's not what people in this building want to hear. And so I, I'm completely with you on addressing that head on. And, if we need to resolve this issue with so much being up in the air, it seems like a simple solution is just take another 30 from the reserve and then we'll have an issue if we, Charlie prevails and we uh, end up not having merger, but we can figure that out yeah. at so that point. I, I would like to kind of throw out a, a way of looking at this is that, uh, cause I, th I think, I'd like to think that everyone around this table feels that the last thing we want to do is cut programs, cut teachers. Uh, um, 
but I think if we look at it in the context, it's, well, it's no longer our, our dollars. I, I, I think about the one of the sort of fundamental arguments that has been made around Act 46 is the inequity of debt that um, is being incurred by towns that planned not to take for their facilities. And we, Middlesex, and you know, people around this table, have definitely pointed to that as being a reason why um, you know, this forced merger is, is, is not right. And so I think for us then to underfund what we know is you know, needs for the capital building kind of runs contrary to that, to that spirit. So I think you know, it kind of can have both ways. Um, that's how I see it. Yeah, I guess I just want clarity on uh, whether it's 60 or 90, where does it go next year if we merge? So if we merge, then it would be into, it would be in one budget, and then we'd have but to look But still for our facilities use. I, well, what, are you talking about the balance, the fund, the capital fund balance? Because that's I, different than bud, uh, budgeting I, for the capital fund. Yeah. That would be a, a you know, district wide. I mean, I think what Bill yeah, was saying before yeah, is that there's, right. and this isn't a certainty, but there are certain things that like endowments or specially designated funds that stay attached to the school. Mm -hmm. um, Chris Leopold um, is thinking that that would also apply to capital budgets, yeah. uh, technology funds, anything that right. is Any specially that's designated. We have but a then lot you can't of still add to it. Well, you, you, you could. could. The, the merge board could decide to. Okay. And the, but it would be the merge the board. The merge board would have to agree. The merge board would be deciding what would be funded out of it for this school. Um, it would be for this school. So like our projected fund and balance is 144,000. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be really transparent. There, and I, Chris, I said this to Chris the other night because we were on the articles committee talking about something like this. I said, somewhere in June, by June, I'm gonna be recommending to you that you leave a certain amount of there for, for bills that haven't come in that we're not sure of yet because there's always some in june right. you never close the fiscal year on june 30th right. it just never happens um you try to get there but you get as close as you can so we're closing an organ if we merge we're having to close an organization so we're going to leave some money there i'm going to have you try to leave as little as much and what i'm going to recommend as your superintendent is that you take as much as you can out of your general fund balance and put it into the rumney capital fund reserve that's one of the questions i have we can do that we yep. can transfer. You can yeah. transfer it. I'm gonna I'm gonna be strongly suggesting that to you. So we could so one of my because I um, I've been probably the, the staunchest person around this table kind of being protective of the capital fund allocation, but one thing that occurred to me was that we're at um, we're at five over five and a half percent uh, or four and a half percent of our um, right. You're about twenty one thousand over your fund. Yeah, right. you're, you're in terms of four percent target. Yeah. yeah. So if we were to, we could potentially, um, we could move pretty much all the money for the last for this year and last year that we didn't uh, properly fund. The so let me say it this way: yep. you have about one hundred and fifty thousand dollars in fund projected fund balance right now at the mm -hmm. end of the year. I would probably recommend about 100 to 110 of that you move over in June. And Laura will give me a better number. She and I have been talking about how do we model for how much we got to leave. That goes into general fund balance that moves over. That, that I would put into your, your capital fund balance. That's where I would suggest you put it. You, there's a couple. You could put it in technology, but I wouldn't suggest doing that. So why wouldn't we put the entire thing in so because there's going to be some bills that we don't know that are oh, there right 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 but 30th. so like the 110 right budget nothing to go in because we already have just put it in and then we are under the threshold you could do under that budget yeah, that's what I'm wondering and we too. don't hit the penalty well that's what that's what kyle was saying so but what you but you have a double whammy on the next year's budget and i'm going to tell you and i've been telling but you we have this. money going in right so whether you're merged or not next year, every school except for one, whether merged or not, and if it's merged, it will be all, will hit will be above the threshold just on health care increases that we're projecting for next year. We're and there's no way the threshold. threshold's going away. Yeah, the threshold's not going away. It's actually getting lower. Because that's unless, a lawsuit. Un, I unless, uh, unless, <laughs> unless, unless, unless the legislature does something, but I don't see them doing that because of just the constant pressures on funding right now. 
So we know that we're looking in a year from now, really drastic cuts across the SU. Really drastic. I mean, like at U32, we're in, we're up in high double digit, not high, high, we're in double digits for number of risks right now because of what we're projecting a year from now. So you can do that, but just realize the cliff that you're making for either yourself and or- And all I was saying was like, if, if our goal was to have 120 in there and we have 110, I'm just saying if it's about what we budget and not what we actually spend, I don't know. But that also discounts um, something blowing up between yes. now and yes. June. Um, so, Absolutely. You know, That's and I, and, and so we can make it contingent. There yeah. can be a contingency of Bill. if it's there, this is what will happen. Oh yeah, that's a good and point. And that's mm -hmm. what we that's can do. Point. Is the is the boiler, has the boiler hit this yet? No, it has not. The boiler is uh, going out to bid Monday. It's because it's due back February 15th. And then the, we'll have the bids in and be going with the boiler replacement during the summer. And cost? Uh, we think it's in the sixty-five dollars to $70,000 range. It's come up because we've waited a year and construction costs right now are going through the ceiling. So so really, if we're, our balance is really going to, is looking more like 80000 Yep. Barring any unforeseen additional roof leaks. Yeah, that, I mean, yeah. Well, that I'm hoping to all under the warranty. <laughs> and, yeah. It's not unforeseeable. <laughs> um, um. So it seems irresponsible to me. I mean, I know that we're going to be potentially merging, but I guess whether we merge or whether we don't merge, it seems deeply irresponsible to just keep. To make a decision just to avoid the threshold. Yes, yeah. to not only to avoid the threshold, but then also to set, I mean, now we just have to make this a harder, worse decision mm -hmm. soon. And I feel, I guess I feel like we're kind of passing the buck in an unfair way to do that. And it, so I guess I, I, um, it makes me uncomfortable to, I hear Kyle's argument for sure, but it sounds like it would be, you know, not, not really lost per se, what's in our capital fund and go into our own personal capital fund reserve. And so. I guess the question is, are we going to let somebody else make these cuts for us, or are we going to do it ourselves what we can? And I guess, uh, I mean, just another thought I had, though, is that when I look at those numbers Bill just gave, um, that sheet he has, it seems like the biggest thing that's causing this problem is a loss of eight students between this year and next year. And so I just come back to what well, you started this with, how do we get people here. Yeah, that's all and, our problem. <laughs> yeah, and, and I think you don't cut any programs and uh, because we do get people because of Spanish and other things that the school brings. And it, I think also avoiding the penalty is helpful too because if you don't have the taxes go up more from that, then that's a benefit. And so at this particular moment in time, the best thing for the budget, including the capital budget and what's available in the future, may well be to underfund it for next year and hopefully we get more students and or we make a, a pitch to the merge board if that happens or if we stay an independent board and that gets figured out next year and it will be hard but for the moment the decision that has to be made right now it seems pretty logical. Would it be helpful um, to, for this conversation, to, to um, I found this sheet, uh, this sort of this spreadsheet that listed the, pro, you know, the, the work that needed to be done, when it should be done, and the cost uh, to be helpful. Uh, it wasn't in your sent. packet, folks. It was a That's what, the email, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I brought extra copies. Oh, let me. Oh, would you pass them along, please? I'm so prepared. I was. Prepared. <laughs> I even have extra time. I mean, I just, I know that Woden and Allison weren't on the board when Matt did his walkthrough with us, but it was so clear the amount of things that he was suggesting were very much proactive, oh, cost up front, save us in right. the long run, or sure. significant safety things. Anybody want one? There, there are extras here, Charlie, if you want to. No, I'm okay. Oh, sorry, Jen. It's okay. Thank you. You're welcome. And 
we'll notice that the numbers fluctuate over time. Yeah. As opposed to it, although I think the uh, suggestion was a steady 120 every year, right? Um, rather than right. fluctuating that's exact, that's per exact, year. That, and that's so, what we try to do. We try to do that with all our capital work, whether it's, yeah, I gave you an example of technology, I could do it here in the buildings. We do it with our cap, you know, we just know, we say, try to keep it steady, because if we can keep more numbers constant in a budget, the better it is for operational mm -hmm. and to program. And we've been able to actually really, because of this, keep Bill Ford part-time with us for three or four years now. Like, he's doing most of the renovations that are happening at U32 <coughs> this summer, which are pretty hefty. Okay. So, um... I'd be curious of just finding out between 2017 and 18 what was advised to be done, what was actually done, so we know a truer sense of where mm -hmm. we stand. Because as I looked through it, I felt like a lot of it wasn't. Yeah, I think because I like that oil burner's on 18, and it actually hasn't. <coughs> hasn't even hit yet. Right. Right. But it, but it will this year. Yeah, later. Yeah, right. yeah. later this year. Oh, no, in 19, right? And yeah. the roof. Roof's been done. Yeah, okay, that has been done. Mm -hmm. Sidewalks have not. The exterior light, I know that was a big one for I think that's staff. been done. Can I see it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here, okay. you, you know it better than I do. Just take my note here. Paving second phase. We haven't I've, done any, we haven't done any the, paving. And the paving was huge to, in his, um, the big, paving? to saving the floors. Right. We did do some paving. The back, the first part. Got it. The back so it's part. the second phase hasn't, okay. Which would be the front circle yeah. here. But he did, uh, there is the carpet put in, which was his That was actually, actually John Hemmelgarten said, instead of paving so much, and we did it at Doty, and I'll let Amy talk about whether it's working or not, but it was something we learned at Berlin in doing their front entrance that it really stopped a lot of dirt coming in with these really okay. aggressive carpets in the lobbies. Mm -hmm. Is it working, do you think? It, it is overall. Uh, the slipperiness is somewhat better, I think, but you know, it has certain. We're still trying to figure out the scrub. We need to probably reinvest in a scrubber. <laughs> yeah, because uh, you have to extract it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You have to extract it. Mm -hmm. But it's built to do that. It's an indoor outdoor. The mm -hmm. playground under the night. Under, uh, so I'm on I don't know, second or third page. So 2019, the 95,000. It says playground. So is that. I think. Isn't that done? Some, some. That was like this summer stuff and um, he was recommending, for safety, also. maybe. He was recommending sort of ongoing, I think I saw it, 5,000 per year for, play for playground. playground. Yeah. But we already ate through 30,000 of that um, last year. Yeah. Um, we have some more needs that we need to deal with. I guess it won't help us tonight, but I would love to hear from Matt again. So Matt doesn't work with us. Oh, he doesn't do it anymore. He doesn't work this for us This was anymore. his recommendation and then he... He left about a year and a half ago. Oh. Dave Hannigan is now our facilities person for U32. We... But you don't have one for the whole SU? I do not. Oh, that's I'm not been able to replace that position. I mean, I understand, but that was really helpful. I would love to have a facilities director for yeah. the SU because I get hit with a lot of it along with the custodial staff, the maintenance and custodial staff. So could we? Well, and then we just get into the um, individualization that mm -hmm. versus somebody who knows all of it. Anyway, go could, ahead. Could we hear from maybe we could all just say our piece on briefly to get a feel for how everybody's thinking on, I mean, I, I feel like we either need to take from our capital fund, well, we need to decide whether or not we're willing to have a penalty, and then we need to decide whether, you know, whether or not we're gonna take from our capital fund and whether or not we're willing to cut, really, the only thing to cut as far as I would tell is a, a, a position of one of our staff members. So, what do you guys think about, maybe everybody just, I think that's great does that seem reasonable? Yeah. yeah. And um, if you want, I'll start. I would say that um, I like where we are now. I'm willing to incur a $31,000 um, overage, um, taking into account the energy save, anticipated energy savings of $7,000. Um, and it, that would be my preference, keeping the um, lower funded for the lower funding for the capital budget, send it down 30000 so it's a $60,000 amount rather than 90000 uh, and, and keep our programs intact. I'm actually less inclined to 
eat down our capital fund. I mean, I certainly don't want to get rid of staff members. Of course, I don't want to get rid of staff members. But I feel like we're going to be, I mean, we have to run the school so that it can actually run. And I'm, I'm concerned that if we just keep taking from the facilities maintenance and capital fund that we have, we're going to be in trouble. So I guess I'd be interested in either looking at a higher penalty and like really, okay, so, you know, what's that mean? That's, you know, $80 per $100,000 of house, so we would even potentially double that to $160 per $100,000 of house. Like, is that something people are willing to tolerate so that we can keep putting money in our capital fund, or do we need to consider? So that we'd be looking then at a $60,000 overage. Mm -hmm. uh, or somewhere which... less than 30000 but I mean, we're way short of the 120 that we're supposed to be putting in, or no, that I, we I want agree. to be putting in. It's half in terms of this right. proposal. Yeah. Um, and I, I guess especially given what Bill said, the idea of the merging, not merging, that seems to be kind of a non-issue, I guess. If, if most of the money is going to go on our capital reserve fund, then I don't feel like there's any strategic whatever that needs to be considered terribly regarding merging. And I'm, it's kind of dirty to talk about it that way anyway, so it's good that it doesn't. So I guess I'd be either in favor of saying, all right, we're going to take this to the taxpayers and we're going to say we're willing to charge more so we can keep Spanish or... No, we have to, or, or whatever it is that we decide, or that we have to to make the difficult decision now. Caroline? Um, when I look at this, the, the latest numbers that Bill has in terms of the threshold, I just think about each budget for the past five years being significantly, the actual was was at least that much less than budgeted, I think. Um, so I feel like, I kind of think there's numbers there without cutting staff, without um, decreasing the capital fund and really looking a little more at what we have available to transfer in and use that in terms of planning um, I guess I'm feeling a little optimistic mathematically that we can do all the things we want. Can I just address that? <laughs> yeah, please. Um, one of the things that's been a steadfast, I don't know what to call it, it's called procedure, is that, um, and one of the reasons why Lori is, I think we've been around here for 25 years, is that she stays conservative, but not too conservative. We've had, since I've been here, we've had budgets that have gone over, but that's been an authorization by the board to do something different than what was in the budget. It's not because we haven't estimated for health insurance increases, unemployment we won't even know until the summer, and other things. And we do that every year, so we bring you a budget that works the way it's supposed to work. I pressed Lori during Christmas. I said, can we lower any more of our percentages and get tighter? She goes, I'm not comfortable going any further. And when she says that to me, I stand with her on that. Mm -hmm. She has 25 years of business manager experience. We do really well because of that. I hear what you're saying. We, we've been lucky that we haven't had many things that have really come at us. The fund balance in Romney got to as low as under 2% while I've been here, and I know there have been years prior to I was here that we got even lower in that, according to Lori. I think that's a really dangerous place for the school, for any school to be, because mm -hmm. you don't know it won't come at you. So I would advise not getting any tighter than we have for estimates. And the problem is, I mean, you know this well, Caroline, because you've worked in schools. You're, but you're 18 months out from, ex you know, right, right now you're six months from the beginning of execution, and the final is 18 months out. Right. We need we need those estimates the way they are. I, I would do as told if you want to have me lower those. You know, not be as conservative, but I couldn't recommend that to you. And that I am I'm fiscally conservative. I mean, and I am too. And I I guess I feel like. Um, I've always led a budget that was under, and I and it just feels maybe like the right time to. Um, to stick more like to tighten the 
the practices around it. And like, I, I don't know, I guess I always feel like we've had this buffer and that's because I don't do the business end and I always worked under really good business managers and I stuck to the budget. Um, I just feel like 30,000, if we were at a different place and we had a budget in, in place and there was a sudden need for $30,000 in books, we would be saying yes and it would be found. So it's, but it's also not how I would do my home budget. So I, I'm really torn. I just feel like I'm, when I'm looking at that figure, it feels more doable that. Um, would be put some numbers to what you're talking about. Yeah, please. so like the, th I mean, th so the threshold was reduced to $38,230. I feel like, um, uh, I feel like um, if we cut 10 from the capital fund and that leaves 28 from other places, I, I don't know, it just feels. But we're not cutting 10, we're, that would be cutting 40. Right, 40, 40 right. right. So, but, but then I take what we, it pr looks like projected that we would have, we could say maybe we feel comfortable that we would have 40 to put in in June. Mm -hmm based on our actuals right now. I don't know. I mean, I, I do I do think it's risky. I feel but I feel like it I feel like what I'm saying is not to play with the um, budget so much as that threshold. And if it's about what we budget and not what we spend, I would rather under budget and pay after and not and avoid the penalty and maybe that is my huge bias about the penalty and that it was designed to close small schools but I, the risk is then we pay we go over budget so we under budget for the first time in however long because we could do the research and then what what happens if you under budget you get into deficit spending or you take from the fund balance. Or you take, or you you take from the fund you balance. Just shift it. Like, but, so I, I guess that's what I'm saying is I've never, like, I don't believe in debt. I don't, I don't believe in overspending. But I think we could just tweak it and so, I so, guess I'm saying manipulate a little bit in terms say, of the threshold. Because I think if we're going to lower the budget to be out of the penalty, you have to indicate cuts somewhere in the budget, right? Yeah. And, and then <laughs> you're saying, well, where is that going to, and, and if you're, rep and it's also representation to the community. We're representing that this is what we need, um, and if we're really thinking right. about we need more, uh, and, and yeah. oh, we needed more enough to get into the penalty. It's like, well, why didn't you know that before? Yeah. Well, we kind of did. And I, mean, I do also believe in going to the public with exactly what we need, not more, not less. This is what we believe it costs to educate our children. I just, okay, so that's, that's where I'm at is I, I look at that number, it feels more manageable mud there, than 100,000. <laughs> <laughs> so are you saying that you feel like we can get that zeroed out or do you're comfortable with being on the threshold? No. I'm not comfortable being over the threshold. So I guess what I'm saying to answer the question about capital fund is I think 30 is too much to, to decrease it. Um, and and you don't want to be over the threshold? And I don't want to be over the threshold and I don't, I don't want to cut programs. Um, so I'm not being helpful at all. Um, I agree with you on all <laughs> Everybody here does. Um, I, <coughs> I don't know. When it was a hundred thousand, I I stood behind my vote of cutting thirty. So I guess, yeah, I would I would vote to cut it by thirty, knowing that um, I would take the risk of in June we would be able to put in that thirty. So that's what I would vote for okay, hold if on. we so, voted tonight. So you're saying yes, except over penalty by thirty eight. And put 30 from the No, I'm in. saying I would vote to decrease the capital fund by 30. An additional 30? The, so it would be 60. So it would be 60. So yeah, it's. So. So, so what's represented? So what's would, represented yeah. here. And then be over the threshold by. 31. 31 if we take the energy. Put, anticipated energy savings with an estimate of 38 
But there's that $7,000 energy savings that Bill noted to us but hadn't included in that letter. Yeah. Right. Just keep the lights off. All the <laughs> Don't need to fill the wood chip in. <laughs> yeah, I guess I'm saying I'm standing by what I but what I said last time is the 30. I Hold on, so, so putting 60 in the capital fund mm -hmm. and being over the threshold by 31. Potentially. I mean, that could, that could go away, but you put- Or it could be, be more, right. Or it could be more, you're right. And then the, 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 that avoids cutting program? Mm -hmm. yeah. With no program cuts. Well, so the no program cut. So I still, though, am interested in looking at our per pupil spending and the results of um, the audit being done with the special ed department and those things. Because if there's a reason that our per pupil spending is above other schools, um, it would be helpful to know what those things are. Um, you know, uh, it, like take Spanish is a program that we offer that other schools don't. That cannot be the reason I for thought it that was the much bond. of an increase. Isn't it our bond that makes our per pupil spending. spending more? I mean, I don't no, know. I think no. to educate this one? kids, all, every school has facilities use. Every like there. So, if there's an yeah, area sure that um, should be looked at, that we are somehow giving more than what is needed i believe in kids getting what they need um if we are doing something that is off and it is not in line with best practice i would want to know that I, that is a cut i would be willing to look at if the administrators came back and said something like that but in terms of just um nobody else has spanish so i think we should cut spanish absolutely not i think there's I, I think there's benefits to that, and I think we would make a cut, we would feel it, it would impact staff, and it's still not gonna help in terms of the, the, the threshold, and more importantly, in terms of the per pupil spending. Um, so, so what I'm saying is I do still care about the per pupil spending and finding out, um, you know, like if, if you meet with other principals and, and we look at, at you know, like looking at the number of pairs in each school versus the number of students in I, on IEPs versus the number of students in the school. Is there a reason our percentages are off that um, fits with other SUs and schools with um, our demographics? Or is there a reason that, that we're off somewhere and we need to look at it? But in terms of the part of the budget and the capital fund, because <coughs> I actually won't be on the board in June to vote, but um, that it looks now that we would have money that we could put in there, which would get us to the numbers that Matt had recommended a year and a half ago. Um, that is where my vote would be tonight. So you're saying we don't go over the threshold, we put 60 into the capital fund in our budget, and we then look forward to trying to figure out how we can lower our per pupil spending costs to see if over time those those savings that are not yet conceptualized are sufficient to replenish our capital fund? Uh, yes, except I think by putting 60 in the capital fund, we do st we are still over the threshold. We are. Okay, so we are so, over, so be over the threshold. Right. Okay, I'm sorry, I thought you were not wanting to do it. I mean, I don't. So you, I thought you wanted to tighten up the budget everywhere else. Just, you know. Okay. All mm -hmm. right. I'm good. Brian? <laughs> um, I, I don't want to exceed the threshold. Um, I guess one, with the question that, something that you said prompted this question for me is that, uh, could we provide the same educational instruction and social emotional support to students in a different way than we currently are doing now that would save us money? And that, that's what I would ask the administration if they felt that that was achievable. It's an easy question. <laughs> <laughs> But I mean, we didn't think, as of last year, we didn't think that was achievable. And Amy petitioned for another position, I think one half-time position. And so we added, you know, we added one, a full-time, didn't we add one full-time position between? Right, but that doesn't mean there isn't a surplus somewhere else. 
I'm just trying to address Brian's direct question. Social, emotionally, are we so supporting? And we said, Amy felt like we were doing well where we are now, but didn't feel well when we had that one position less. So. Yeah, so my yeah. So my question is like, you know, could we do things? Yeah, it's. I'm not advocating for at all for cutting. Um, the you know the. Forget what's the tier two, what's under tier two, you know, what I'm just saying is that, just as a way of looking at this, is that, you know, are we, um, can we provide all the different opportunities that we provide and supports we provide in the service, uh, in the school, um, differently, and save money, not spend as much money to do so. Um, I feel, I'm asking this question because I feel like there's been hints of that in conversations over time that I've heard come from the administration, and so, um, and Bill in particular, and so I'm just, uh, is that is that a non-starter or not? But if it, so if it's not, fine, I'll move on, but. I just, that almost seems like that's something we should say, based on a budget that we have, try and do things differently and see if it still provides the same level because to ask the question, say, will it provide? Mm -hmm. You yeah. know, that's, there's so many moving pieces on that. So, that yeah, it's not, gonna, an, it's I was not a really address, fair question. Was, yeah, I was going to address the will. It's hard to address. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I just told you as I looked at this, we're looking at different ways in which we're providing special ed services. I want to give the authority and the power to the group of special educators that are working with Amy and Kelly to look at how they're doing services. I don't know the result of that yet. I wish I did. But I don't, and I want to give them the authority to look at that and say, "So how can we do this?" And, and is there a reason that um, that Kelly is working with Rumney on that? Is she working at all schools, the, or was there a number? Issue? Right now, it's here because of the budget issue. There are other years she's jumped in because of budget issues, but some of that came from a review of looking at just looking at IEPs. Now that's happened in other schools other years that we've had to look at it. Um, it, I told you about how we did that in Callis. I told you how we did that in East Montpelier. You know, we did that at U32 this year and looking at how we're providing services and how can we change that from... Um, was there a budget just difference to clarify, in it? Just, oh, oh, sorry. sorry. I was, gonna, was there a budgetary difference yep. in terms of reducing seven and add, but yep. adding special ed? Yeah, adding some special some ed, teachers. but there's been a reduction in, in budget too. Okay. Um, when you say budget issues, was it the special ed um, expenses coming from no, we look Rumney at, or like budget meaning we were over the threshold we we so, the board put so some I'll pressure be, I mean I'll just be really clear and this is not going to win me anyone for fans but you know when you look at the number of paraeducators that we have here at Rumney and the work in which they're doing which is a lot of instructional where we're hearing from many, much of the research we look at from many different organizations that the best thing to do to teach kids is to have a highly qualified teacher and to start to group kids into small groups instead of individual mm -hmm. instruction, that's part of the impetus of looking at. That's and that maybe isn't something, uh, how does it work when schools move from one model to another? Does it take time? It's more than just what so we could it, do it, in it's, this it's budget? It's not just a special education piece because general education is part of that as well. Sure. So it means people change how they do work. And, and it changes and how kit, where instruction happens. And that's part of what Act 173 passed last year in the legislature is pushing on us, is pushing on us to do a different model, the model that we're looking at that we're moving towards to where there's teachers providing the instruction in more small group and it's done in the classroom. So would it support that effort for us to um, impose the cut on the administrations or to let it naturally happen through a recommendation that comes out of what they're doing now well I think in change for anybody the more that that's discovered by the folks that are going to make the change mm -hmm. the better the change happens even though sometimes it takes longer to get into it initially mm -hmm. that the overall timeline is less um, but we've had times where that's been imposed because a board has said we want, and that's what happened at U32. We want 3%. We don't tell you how to do it. You go find it, come back to 3%. Tell us what it did. So then for me, and I know that I'm 
already had my turn, and I'm taking some of yours, but I I feel like (coughs) without hearing specifics from the administrators about areas that we are providing more than what is needed, like if like if the audit was already done and we had, you know, four. So I I want to change. I want to change your words, Caroline. Okay. Because it's not more. Mm Mm-hmm. It's, it's just different. It's the way it's being done. And so in the way it's being done, we've been doing this very similar here at Romney for many, many years. It's an, it's a model that's not the model that's being used, I would say, in most of that. Let me say, it's not the model that 173 is going to push every school in Vermont into. That's part of 173. Act 173 was passed last year in the legislature is saying, you know, paraeducators will not be doing instruction because you're gonna you're gonna get defunded from it. It's gonna be done through funding. I, okay, and so a question I have is: um, Is Romney the only one doing that? Because we there was something specific uh, about our per pupil spending. So in terms of how um, special ed is done, do we have more students per IEP that have? So when I say more specifically, I mean having a one on one or one on one time versus small group. To me, one on one so time. So you're getting a place more. where I need Kelly sitting. Okay. To, that I can't get to. But that's not something that, like, the two of you um, have looked at in terms of an area to recommend us to cut. That's what I'm saying is uh, if, if it was something that was that you were recommending, I could say, yes, I would support that, whether it's a reduction of however much was recommended. So but without that. So, so, Caroline, the way I've worked with all the other boards, mm-hmm. they've usually said, here's the target, find a way to get there. A budget target. A budget target. And you guys are really resisting telling us that. So I know. If you're not going to tell <laughs> us the target, I'm not going to take put my head out there and tell you what the cut is. And uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, I agree. Yeah, okay. I mean, I we're not asking to you. Well, that she is yeah. the way she's asking oh. me questions. Yeah, I, yeah, I was. Okay. <laughs> and I'm not going to do that no. because it, it it it's just like you know we need to work together as a team. Yeah. So if you're going to say this is where we want to land, go find out and bring us back your best recommendations with the least amount of effect on student learning, we'll do that. But when you and this was part of the discussion last month, too. Yeah. You guys have to give us a target. You got to do it as a board. That's a board responsibility. Well, in terms of, uh, I mean, you've given, you us a, you've given us a well, you've given us a budget number, and we're right. working with it right now. Right, right. Yeah. But okay. tell us, don't. Right. What Caroline's trying to do is get me to say, so this is how you want to cut. Okay, good. The administration just told us how to cut the budget, and they, you know, without us telling how much it is to go. For well, it. I think the I part of the inquiry is saying, no, is saying it, where it, where's no, the but, least amount of harm done in, if there was going to be right. a budget cut, right? And. and I get so here is the thing. Last time I felt like I guess I felt unsure about how it would be implemented and feeling like what was said was and I'm paraphrasing but something about there's more paras at Rumney. Now it's being said, now I understand a little more about how it's being used. My fear was if we just said, "Okay, there's more, let's cut." Well, if the, if if the design has been dependent on it to suddenly shift because the board cut money, I would be very nervous about how that would impact students and how that would impact staff versus the audit process. But now I'm hearing that if we had said, you know, cut this amount of money, there would have been more of a, I guess I would call it a soft landing. Services wouldn't just be yanked because. We don't yank. The, services and and I and as a board member last time it, it, because we didn't get into the specifics that's how I left feeling was I don't know it felt like something wasn't quite right but I don't know what the plan would be if we were to agree financially to to address it 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 made me a little unsure I think we're gonna move move on to Brian yep okay so you can complete his thoughts <laughs> sorry no that's all right I I don't even know what to say. That's a big part. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I I don't want to exceed the threshold, um, and I, I guess the idea of of paying the penalty, like regardless of how we might feel about the validity or the you know, the um, the penalty itself and why it's in place and whatnot, um, I, 
for us basically asking um, community members to pay more and pay more dollars that isn't actually investing in um, our local school, it, I have a hard time um, moving forward with that and being in, feeling comfortable and, su and supporting that. Um, I run the capital fund. Uh, you know, I have a, a, a different, perhaps, feeling than I did going in, knowing that uh, what we do now about reserve funds and how we can transfer them and whatnot, that gives us more flexibility uh, than I initially thought. So I guess where I'm going with that is that uh, could I potentially uh, live with the 60 that we've at this point allocated, knowing that it, um, that we would basically make up for that and more so with the transfer later in the year, and it would allow us to get under the threshold, I could get behind that. Um, you guys are talking so far above my head. Does that, does that, Brian, mean that you wouldn't need to make cuts then? If we got, if we got below the threshold? Yeah, just exactly what you laid out just then. Um, if, we, if we get below, I mean, we, um, <coughs> to get below the threshold, we're going to have to cut somewhere. Yeah. And so it's cutting from our, you know, allocation to the capital fund. Right. It's, you know, or it's to services and programs, uh, or it could be to other things. That's sort of what I understood, weird. but I thought I sort of heard you say, I'm sorry, I mean to do this, but I just I just wanted to understand. It sounded like you were saying that you would get below the threshold via the capital fund. No, I guess, so what I was saying is that uh, while I'm not, I, I've been not in support of us reducing the capital fund mm -hmm. at the level that was originally proposed, I, knowing that we can transfer funds into the, uh, into that budget from our reserve funds at the end of the year, <coughs> I could live with that if it got us below the thresh penalty threshold. Okay. Does that make sense? I think so. Okay. But it still doesn't leave me quite clear on whether that would still necessitate. You still need 31,000. Well, we still need 31,000. 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, okay. Yep. Thank you. Um, and so like- Of cuts. Que yeah. Of and cuts, so yeah. like questions I have, and um, this is at this point is nitpicking, uh, but it's, you know, what, you know, what, what are the extras that the, uh, the school is currently paying um, and, and things? And maybe it's nothing, but I'm thinking like our sugaring program, our artisan residency. Those uh, are tiny. Our, yeah, those are, those our are four are, wins. Those are tiny. Those are, those well, are nothing. But you, you say add up this, tiny, like, yeah, add all that, all here, that. Fit, like, are you talking about like 10, 15, 20, or are you talking 500, 1,000? We're, we're, I mean, four wins is maybe 4K total. We took it all over. I don't know exactly. And the PTO fundraises for residency and also fling performances. Yep, right, right. I mean, so I, I know we didn't, we, that doesn't cost us anything. That doesn't cost Sugaring us. really doesn't, I mean, that's all volunteer based. But four wins, four, four, that's $4,000, four, that's $4, right? I mean, I'm like. It wasn't 4000 well, It wasn't 1800 okay. Okay. okay, yeah. Okay. So, um, but I mean, so the, 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 those, are, those are the types of things that I, I think we at least need to, at least I, I feel like we need, need to consider where, you know, um, and I'm not advocating for cutting Spanish, but, you know, if people want to protect Spanish, you know, well, what are we potentially willing to, to lose uh, instead of, of that or uh, whatever other program it might be uh, or staff position it might be. I think about the food service, and this is uh, probably completely impractical at this time. But we always hear about how well Doty does with their food service budget. I understand it's because of the community involvement with it, but could we partner with them? And would there be cost savings if we were, you know, providing the same sort of operating the same meal service out of one kitchen to both to both schools? Um, I don't know. Um, looking for different ways to whittle this down. Mm -hmm. uh, Fair enough. The thing that occurs to me is technology. I'm kind of in Woden's boat, so I wonder like how much, you know, do we require? It's, it's, Go ahead. Oh, let's I yeah. Yeah. So, 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 yeah. as, I'm, as, I'm, as I'm nitpicking, I had some other questions. Is that, 
Um, you know, I, I noticed a five thousand dollar increase under uh, technology software from last year right. to this year. Is there is that is that going to be is that eight thousand anticipated to be an ongoing expense or is that total? Is there do we know what the increase what that is for? Is that at page eleven, the top of page eleven? Page ten under instruction related technology services. Some of that's green box. So five thousand of that is green box. So that which goes we didn't which we hadn't budgeted for previously. previously. And at this point it's not covered in the SU okay. technology because it was a pilot here. Got it. Okay. Um, we have a four thousand dollar increase in field trips. Um, Oh, no, I'm sorry. Because no, we no, I'm sorry. I'm looking at the wrong. I was looking at. No. We cut it the year before, and we saw our actuals were around seven, so we made it. Okay. okay. We go back to actuals. We go back to. We, we go back and rebase the budget every year. Uh, the other question I had is that at one point in time, we had two custodians, and now we, I know we don't have three full time, but we have three different. Three different people, too. People. I don't know if that. Is this equals the same amount of employees as it was before? Close but it's close enough. It was more employees, more FTEs than what we had before. But what we need to cover this building for the cleaning needs. Is it uh, with more people though? Are we incurring more um, additional? And we had some costs? services coming from U32, and the cost shift was about the same. Maybe benefits you're talking. That's about? what I mean. Yeah. Yeah. That, no. It, it. No. It doesn't change the. If we go from fractional to whole, but probably actually, what does it add? A benefit? Are you talking about what does it? I'm add? asking you since we have three instead of two people, are we paying three people's benefits rather than two? No, because we, there's we were already paying people through the SU. Mm -hmm. We just moved to a building base for more flexibility for our own staffing. So if somebody was out sick, yeah. it's easier. It's easier for us to be able to call our own person in to cover their colleague than it was to get somebody who's already booked fully to U32. So, um, so did we incur an additional cost in order to achieve that? No. Okay. Not really. It was just moving it from an, a U32 cost okay. fee into our own personnel. You know, the uh, $30,000 is one hundredth but one point zero one percent of the entire three million two hundred seventy five thousand dollar budget to show you how small it is, but it, it carries weight because of the penalty, because of the threshold. Um, I'm done at this point. Um, I'll be quick. I'm in a very different place than I was last meeting, I am willing to go with this budget as laid out. I think um, capital fund for the reasons that have been discussed. Um, and also because of your extraordinary fiscal conservatism, and I feel pretty confident that it is not going to be 30K, but um, quite a bit less. Um, but I am willing to go over the threshold up to that amount. You think the threshold will be less than 30? Um, well, my understanding is if we don't, we don't budget, I mean, if we don't spend the entire it's amount, not, it's then not, it's, it's not, on the, the threshold's on based on the budget, budget based on the, the spending amount. Okay, so, oh, I see, okay, got the it. The penalties get right. set in this July. Got it. By the, between that the tax the department yeah. and yeah. AOE, I don't know okay. exactly who does it. So just to be yeah. clear, we could do a budget that's 31000 over next year, spend 31000 less than we intended, but we still get hit with the penalty. Be because right. it's based on what we budget. That's what was arguing. That, that was my point in trying to find a loophole around it, although the more I think about it, it feels a little uh, like fraud, <laughs> like misleading, <laughs> right? Like it's a little, no. it's just hard because I have, uh, every budget is, I maybe because I don't, it's not my role to understand why you, but why you budget that way. So once we're in the penalty zone, um, we're in the penalty zone, right? Yeah, and like I said, it, it, I just don't, we have the best, for, we have one of the best forecasters in the state. She does a good job, but things can change. I, we just yeah. don't, you know, it's like, it's, it's just like making the snow day call yesterday. I had a forecast that was telling me not to go to school, and I had town crews that were telling me go to school, and I went with a forecast. 
You know, and I think you made the right call. Yeah, and I think absolutely. I made the right call. Right. Some days, <laughs> some some days, I don't make the right uh, call. You know, it's the information you have. It's it's the oh, information yeah. you have at that point. Yes. We have the best information we can give you right now, and that's what you have. What? I, I'm it's gonna, not going to change in the next month. It's going to change May. Okay, so I'm just okay. going to go back there though. What is so if we, versus a penalty versus going over budget? accidentally by 31,000. Why is that like? I, I haven't looked into what is in the statute to tell me if there's a, a reverse type of penalty or not. I haven't ever asked that question. So I know how it's mechanically done in July when you have a budget. So we could have a major system failure that cost us, you know, 60 to 80,000. So then we would probably be applying for a waiver with the state of Vermont. Okay. And we well, don't intentionally budget so that we have a hundred thousand dollar surplus. No. We budget based on what we think is going to spend. Yeah, and, the and then and, we are very and, careful of right. how much, and, and usually, we only spend what's and needed. And usually, the biggest places where we get savings is out of personnel. Either we get changes, someone leaves and someone comes, someone changes their health care, a life incident happens, so that changes their health care. Mm -hmm. You know, that's where that's. That's where the dollars are. I mean, okay. in any school budget, I, I haven't done the percentage for Rumney, so let's just call it 70%, is in HR costs. You know, I, I, I haven't done it in a year or two for Rumney, so it, that's where the, and that's, and that's where the forecasting is happening. If you look at everything, anything else outside of that's not a personnel, those are really solid numbers. Because the personnel costs, it's not the cost of someone south. Well, actually, this year because we're in negotiation, so we have a factor in there for that. What did we factor? I will not say that in open session because you're in negotiations right now. Okay, and if say we factored uh, hypothetically one percent, and we go into negotiations and we agree to two percent, to two. I was going to say like five percent, but like it's not you say, say say we agree to two, but we don't agree until August first. So we're in previous, and then our years, personnel, in, pre, in previous years where that's come from is yep. from fund balance. So whatever's figured in here, can we decrease it by 31000 go into negotiations, and then move from the fund balance? <laughs> it is legal. I like it. <laughs> I don't like the I did not expect this from you. <laughs> I really don't like the threshold. That's all. You can do that. I would not recommend it. Okay. I think it's because the it will you, affect negotiations. Um. It's an ethical thing for me. Mm -hmm. You do the best you can with the numbers you have. We have a pretty good shot of what we know. We're, we've happen. been pretty close. We've okay. been pretty close every year about whenever we're in negotiations about where we land. Okay. I haven't been off since, well, I haven't been off and I don't think Lori's been off more than a percentage point in a long time. How much is a percentage point? One percent of, if you say 70% of the budget, yeah, don't go that way. Okay. Chris. Okay. I don't want to scare you. Can you use your calculator? Mm -hmm. Sure. I'm pretty good at doing that. And we know that's health nice. insurance, or we don't. We do. Twelve percent. That's we do. We know that's twelve sure. percent. Okay. And well, you're looking that up, though, just so I understand. There's really a hundred thousand dollars that's kind of capital. If you go to the reductions, you have sixty thousand that's going to capital funding. And then we have this forty thousand that's an average of what's spent on technology. But both those are items that could be skipped for a year, or at least reduced for a year without impact to the school. Right? That's not true. Technology would have impact to the school. If you but. You don't have to spend the forty thousand next year. Like we just got a bunch of new technology. 
You so could it, spend twenty thousand next year and sixty the it, following. It, you're you're making a hole that will cost you more the next year. We 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 <laughs> went down to ninety in the capital fund last year with the expectation that we would fund it at one hundred and twenty this year. Um, Can you, once you go down, yeah. it's. Anytime you go down, you make a yep. double cliff, the net. you make double the amount the next year. But that might actually up. be cheaper than hitting the cliff Two this times. year, particularly if the merger happened and there isn't the same cliff if the costs are spread. If the merger happens, there wouldn't be a cliff. This year. Because all the budgets would be combined. Oh, see, that's why it's so. It just seems that we're bringing our cliff with us, right? If we underfunded, right? Right. True, to have so to make quite, up for what was, it when what we're... What would 1% uh, what's, what's 1 worth in salary? Is that what your question is, Carolyn? About 15000 but that's across all personnel. Okay, so the 30000 was, that would be a significant percentage. Then you're talking 2%. Yeah. I understand now. In my head, it was like 0.2%. <clears throat> okay. Okay. Um, are we ready to? Uh, <laughs> well, just one more question. So, Bill, in terms of the equalized pupil mm -hmm. numbers that are coming out whenever they come out, do yeah. you have a sense of how, how that is likely to shift us and what kind of numbers we're talking about? And you know, how how could that affect our budget, both positively and negatively? So here's part of this, that's not an easy question to answer. The reason for that is that the taxes in Middlesex are based on the number of students you have at U32 mm -hmm. and the number of students you have here at Romney. So one of the things that Middlesex has been in a place for the past couple of years, like right now for next year, we're looking at 54% of the students are in this school. It's been as high as 60%. The bubble is moving. Mm -hmm. That's why we're projecting Roma to really go down in the Got next it. couple yeah. years, okay? Mm -hmm. So the bubble's moving to U32. So while you say that, if I take... The costs... Um, <clears throat> Ed's spending... Thanks. I'm glad you brought your calculator with you, Chris. Mm -hmm. my phone, which is perfect. Um, zero heat. So the Rumney education spending, this is not a number you have in front of you, but this is the number that's the denominator in all this, is three million. Eighty-three thousand five hundred thirty-six dollars. You don't. You can write that down, but it, it's just kind of Pretty how you nice. get to the calculation. You have right now in this draft, as of December twenty-eighth, one hundred and fifty-two equalized pupils. So if I change that, so that gives you a ed spending. Now this is not the penalty formula, okay? But this is a. I'm giving you a kind of a back of the envelope way to do this. So don't take this as a, this is your equalized spending because I haven't taken out the revenue. Okay. The, the cost allowment for the bond here and all that, big picture. But it's, this is the easiest way to answer your question, Woden, without going around an Excel spreadsheet. It is $20,286 per people. If I change the, if I decrease it by one. Number of students. Number of students equalized. I'm just trying to give you the effect of decrease. Yep, that was exactly. really Woden's question. Yeah. The way I understood it. So then the equalized spending becomes twenty thousand four hundred twenty. So what? That was a difference of four hundred dollars. Four hundred dollars. Okay, good. Because I'm not when I do numbers like this, I can't even keep. I'm usually pretty good with numbers in my head, but not. And if I increase it, because I'm moved, not writing anything down. Five three six divided by 153, then I get to, if I go to 153, it's 20,153. 
So it's a difference. Of, you know, that's a that's, that's a, a shift of two. Review. That's a shift of yep, two. Yeah. You know, of for three hundred dollars. So, you know, maybe it's a hundred and fifty dollars per equalized pupil, two hundred dollars per equalized so pupil. So we're not talking large amounts of money here. Well, you are when you get into the penalty area because what I haven't done is backed out the cost of the bond, and your threshold is eighteen thousand three hundred and eleven. So I mean, it just you you really get into pennies here. I mean, that's why we give you the total amount in the budget that you, you're away from it, and that's why you know this is this sounds cruel, but it's just the way it's done in finance circles, the way it's said. An elementary student, when equalized, is not worth 1.0 student. Mm -hmm. It's worth a ratio, and that's the last ratio they calculate once they know all the student information in the state. Right now, it's running at about 93.2%. Uh, couple more students, couple less students, that could run to 90, 93.5. Mm -hmm. And that changes the weight in the equalization and then changes the number of pupils you have. I don't think it's gonna move more than one or two. Okay. You know, overall, because we've got all but two or three SUs in, but That's it's great. not That's, solid. That's exactly what I wanted to know. Thank you. And there, I mean, knowing Brad James, Brad's on top of this stuff the best he can. So when we, I, I apologize, I was looking for something else and not hearing all of this. Are we saying that we're looking at around twenty thousand? Per pupil? Well, yeah, I mean, your your cost per pupil right now, your cost, your local ed spending per equalized pupil is 20286 right now. Okay? Mm -hmm. So, you know, your, that's, I mean, that's just where you're at. That's, that, and so, you know, you've got to, you're not far away from it, but you've got to get, that's, that's the 38, and I said I, I brought you seven more tonight kind of on the back of the envelope because you know laura told me hey i think we can do seven thousand energy savings between electricity and heat yeah that that's we've been re and we, i don't know how many times we've gone through this budget trying to look for i mean what when you you know you guys talk about little individual things we can do yes i think the theory that most of us operate on as administrators is you can do those little things um, but they're not gonna they're little pieces that give the culture part and the learning program for the school while it hurts an individual to not say they have a job to me it's I've always said to boards it's the second worst thing I have to do the first thing is to say a student you don't can't come to school you're expelled um, is that Usually we find a way in schools, in my career, to find a way to get that work done. It's not as easy, it means change. It's not nice to the person. And it usually happens. You ready to call the question? Or at least start voting on potential options. Okay, um, anyone want to make a motion? No, because I have no confusing. idea what it would be. Okay, then, then I will take a, a stab at it. Um, so, Bill, this this budget number of three million two hundred seventy-five thousand four hundred sixty-seven um, assumes an overage of thirty-one thousand dollars. No, it doesn't. You'd have to take seven thousand dollars off of that. Off of this number. Off of that memo number. Okay, so two sixty-eight then. Four seventy. No, I'm sorry. No. Let me do it for you, Chris. Four sixty. Three two seven five four sixty. Have uh, 467 and eight, you'd have 3,268,467. 467. Okay. I'm just using the yeah, zeros great, in there. Great, thank you. Okay. So I would uh, move that we uh, adopt the budget of $3,268,467 um, for the 2000. Uh, 19 uh, 2020 uh, school year uh, understanding that it might put us in the penalty zone and I make that part of our motion so that our community knows that we're doing that up front um, second okay any more discussion yes sorry 
if we merge, it does not include a penalty or it includes less of a penalty? If you uh, were merged, like looking at all the other budgets, yep. the whole district would be under the threshold. Under the threshold. In so there would be no penalty. And the, you have been asked to um, move in the direction as though merging is happening. Yeah. I, as I said to everyone who asked me, I, to keep my license, I have to do as so ordered by this Secretary of Education. Yep. So, so in terms of us voting, yeah. Okay. But so, and correct me if I'm wrong. So, it, each of the schools were developing their budget, and then they were going to be combined to at least be roughly the unified budget for the first year. Yep. We're so, not looking to do much different than what's done at these boards, and Laura and I are kind of hoping that. <laughs> okay. I'm ready to vote then. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Okay. Um, are we, do we need to make any type of, do we, um, what type of procedure do we need to follow to um, direct monies from the reserve fund to the capital fund? You would have another, you would have another motion at some point to move the money like you have in other years when you move money around. Um, would anyone entertain, um, a motion on that prior to voting on this. So you want to table this motion and address yes. a motion on yes. moving the reserve? Okay, so I, let's, let's do you mind? I, I, no, 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 I, I I have no problem with that I feel at all. a little bit more comfortable with the vote having already made us, all, uh, us having a vote on what to do with that money. Okay, so um, what is currently in our fund balance? Is it 140 some odd thousand? It's like 100 people, let me look. So okay. right. Just so we know what the. One of the things Lori taught me was don't try to say numbers. Clear. So, what's the. Why would we not be um, 31K into the penalty zone? So if we merged. Yeah. Okay, only in the. Or, or, or if the number. No. No. If what's the numbers the come back differently, right. yeah. um, they. Okay would potentially reduce our per pupil. These they could. There, there's factors like there. Yeah. It, 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 there's so many us, numbers. There's our equalized pupil numbers. numbers. <laughs> the board hasn't set what they consider the appropriate per pupil spending. Got it. Actually, they have. They did that in statute back in 2015. There's factors of what the dollar yield is. So that's where it may they, be. They set that back in 2015. Okay. They said, okay. and it, it's a long conversation, Projected which I'm not going to go into. Years ahead. Got it. <laughs> So you currently have 151,000 in your general fund balance, which is 4.6 percent. That's 20,000, 21, almost 21,000 over the 4 percent. Um, What's in our reserve fund right now? Your that's reserve, a, that's your reserve fund for capital is that what you meant, yeah. Allison? So currently, it's 144,000. What are we doing? We asking what what is our reserve? Reserve capital fund. Yeah. Oh, is it a balance? And it's how much? 144,000 is in our current capital fund reserve. Okay. And what's your motion, Brian? Right. So, yeah, so I'm trying to I'm trying to figure this out as I go exactly how to I, I feel like we need to to first determine how much money we should have set aside to pay bills. So uh, I, I can't tell you that today. I just I I I I understand you can't view that, but even a ballpark like should we have I would 25 move. 50 Right now, where you're at, I wouldn't move more than, than if you have 150, I wouldn't move more than 60 into your capital fund right But now. if we set it for uh, effective June 30th, could we do that? Yeah. It would be a contingent motion and just have a date certain when that would happen. And you could set reasons to revote. So yeah, you can you can change it, can move it back at any time. I, I, one caution is the as I've read the statutes, it talks about funds dedicated to specific yeah. purposes. So when you make that motion, whether it's now or in June, I think you'd want to say the specific things from Matt's list that are. No, I wouldn't. I wouldn't go into there because I think that's actually hampers this board and the other board. But I would. I'm going to go where I thought you were going to go is if you need to dip back into those funds that are in the capital fund because it's a voter approved fund, you can go do that, but it's, it's harder to pull money out of that capital fund reserve. I'd rather have you do something tonight 
that makes you feel better. And I'm telling you, I'm recommending to you as your superintendent, you don't go over 60,000 to move into that capital fund and then do it again later. Okay, I can do that. But in the capital fund, <laughs> the language when it talks about things not being pooled, it says funds dedicated to specific identified school purposes. Does capital fund? According to our, turn, our attorney, believe, he said there is no statute on this. Chris Leopold's probably the most knowledgeable person on all this merging and non-merging, and he's with the voluntary mergers as well. He's talked about you know having the capital reserve funds if they were intended for Romney coming in, they stay with Romney or Doty, and and people. The other elementary schools are having the same discussion about you know let's let's make sure those funds get as flush as we can with our general fund balance. Well, some are talking about spending those as much because there is a risk it gets pooled. There, if it's not no, no actually right. there isn't. That's what I'm saying is our legal attorney, our legal you counsel. Might be wrong. Right, that's and, the risk. That's, that's the risk. That's with Downs Raffles, right? No, no, he's not. Oh, okay. He works um, McNeil. Yeah, McNeil, oh, Lenny, and Sheen. Yeah. I just wonder if the motion should be to a commitment to move the maximum amount in June but not actually put the wording in now so i think we'll have a better sense in june where everything is and i'd rather do it then I, that's why i'm suggesting to the board that they do i'm trying to help with a feeling of the 60k yeah and i i could feel comfortable keeping 90 which is that's getting low because a couple a system fail which i doubt is going to happen in this building but we have a couple kids come in that are high cost <clears throat> which you just never know we could be eating the rest of that fund balance up i mean the system fail would come out of the capital could come, out, it could, could come yeah. out of the capitals too. Um, versus kids would not. Yeah, they'd be other reserve, general reserve fund balance. So I, I, I mean that's where I feel comfortable saying to you: if you want to move sixty tonight, move sixty tonight, and then do the rest in June. What, so just you said it's more difficult to uh, take funds out of out of a capital. So I've never had to go totally research it, but I have. I remember asking Scott Cameron this question, and Scott was like, you know, you can do it. The boards have the authority to move it out. Um, I don't know if he was talking. Is that when it's a voter? A, a, yeah, a town voter votes to say we want the voters establish dollars. No, no, the voters established this fund. Okay. So the voters have authorized and the technology fund. They've established those funds for. Okay, but, but is it their authorization of a certain amount of money that no, they're voting? No. So it's any it's, money that goes in, it's the establishment because the voters have okay. given you authority to appropriate the audited fund balance mm -hmm. to wherever you would like to do it okay for needs for the school okay um brian you want to make a motion uh yes i move to transfer sixty thousand of thumb balance into the building maintenance fund is there a second second any discussion all in favor aye, aye. aye. any opposed okay that passes um so now we'll take up the second the table motion uh, does anybody want me to repeat it? Okay. Um, all in favor? Are we still in discussion? I just have one oh, we question. can? Yeah, yeah. We so can. we have, the, there is the possibility that numbers come back and these these numbers change. This Like we could be um, more than 31,000 yes. over. Mm -hmm. So my question is, do we want to set a threshold of, on the threshold? Like we are... Um, we are willing to, so let's say it's just 31,000 that we're over the threshold, that that is the ceiling, and that if it comes back and it's 50, then we, we need to figure right. that out. We need because to, we it need would to be then make the cut. And it would mean that we weren't merging. Well, no, because we could get information back even sooner on other factors, right? They could not. I said May. May, okay. Because the only thing we don't have is what the legislature sets the dollar yield at. Okay. What is the expected timeline on the merger decisions? No idea or? Well, um, so the big issue is whether or not um, the, whether the court will grant a stay um, on, on the decision of the board. Which would mean we would stay as we are until a decision Correct. is final, which would be maybe, Correct. it could be a year or two. So what the AG's office agreed to, we asked them to go along with a stay, um, arguing that 
that you know they were uh, they wear a hat that's a little different than an attorney in a private practice because mm -hmm. although they're defending the the agency of education and the board, they also have uh, the interests of they should have the interests of, of the uh, litigants, the plaintiffs in mind too because that is part of the state. So we tried to talk to them to a uh, voluntary stay. And they wouldn't do that, but they did say, if you give us until January 30th to answer your motion um, to stay, uh, we will agree to kick these organization meetings back into February. And then we will both see if we can encourage the court to hold a hearing on the stay and decide it before uh, February 15th. That's asking a lot of the court because of what it has to absorb. Mm -hmm. But I think the court will make an effort to do that. So the direct answer to your question is we have some hope that by the 15th or thereabouts you will know whether we're, uh, we've got to keep going plowing forward with uh, Act 46 or whether, whether we can go back to your old world. Okay. So then we would know, we could set the threshold and we would know by May. But it's May. And it's not going to be a final decision. Right, right. right. No. no, but it would be a stay. If there were a and state, then chances are you wouldn't merge by July 1st. And if it were a state, right. almost by as a, as a, this is a practicality, they have to go to July 20. Right. 20.